I was that skinny boy who got picked on at school. So cliche here, lifted up weights. And Hello and welcome to Founder Stories, the podcast for small business owners. I'm your host, Simon Kalu, and I created this show not only to motivate and inspire, but to give you actionable strategies to take back into your business, shortcutting your route to success. Each week, I'll sit down with real and relatable business owners, uncovering how they've created a business that gives them freedom creates impact and makes money. So let's get started. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Founder Stories. For this one, I am joined by the co-founder of Hure and registered nutritionist, Mr. James Collier. Thanks for joining me. Hi Simon, great to be here. It is a blessing and a pleasure to have you here actually. I I didn't want to research you too much because I didn't want to become too intimidated by your success, which is a lot. For me, I want these conversations to just be conversations. Whereas I started this yesterday and this morning, just researching your bio, having a look at, you know, online. I, I know of Fuel because I watched Diary of a CEO, the podcast, such a successful company, one of the, you know, fastest growing companies of recent times, genuine quality product. No one's got anything bad to say about it. You know, that you don't find any videos online with people saying the formulation is bad or this is, you know, products come out sometimes in health and nutrition that are there just to be marketed and to make money. But to me, Huel is there for a gap in the market and a genuine <clears throat> want and desire to help people. So I'm probably in that intro of now intimidating myself talking to you, but thanks for coming on. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for accepting the invite. Tell me, like as a good place to get started, I like to kind of reverse engineer for all of our listeners. They're used to me kind of showing them where you are now. And then the point of this podcast is to for it to be a bit of a more relatable podcast than something like Diary of a CEO, which is incredibly inspiring but quite high level. We want to get kind of practical insights and advice and for people to understand how you've got to where mm-hmm. you've got to. So for people that don't know who you are, tell me what you do, what's your involvement at Huel and what are you doing outside of that now? And then we'll reverse back. Great, Sam, there's a lot, big intro. Yeah. A couple of things, intimidated. Okay, that's interesting that you, you choose that word, okay. Um, I also wanna come back to about online content about Huel later on. Can we yeah. part that and revisit that? In, yeah, sure. In, in, in the brain? Yeah, definitely. Um, lot to say there. Yeah. Um, but now, obviously, by way of introduction, I'm James Collier. I'm a registered nutritionist. Uh, and let me give you a bit of my background um, there. So I'm co-founder of Huel. So Huel was started in 2015. Yeah. Um, Julian Hearn, who's on a, who can be seen on a lot of other podcasts, including including an early episode of Diary of CEO that you mm-hmm. mentioned. He, he is very much the entrepreneur of the two of us. This, he, Julian is, is founder and I'm co-founder. Yeah. It was his idea. He had this this great idea for to make a nutritionally complete food, and we he contacted me as a nutritionist in 2014, and I came up with the original formula, which was the, the powdered um, pouch that we get in, in the in the white pouch yeah. that people are perhaps familiar with. Um, uh, as a registered nutritionist, means I'm associated with, with the Association for Nutrition uh, in the UK, and mm. I'm also a member of the Nutrition Society. So. Basically, that gives me some credibility as a yeah. nutritionist. I have to, uh, I can't just be a bullshitter, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Something else we should talk about later on. <laughs> um, yeah, now I run everything sustainable nutrition within Huel. So uh, although nutrition is my background of 30 years, I'm also responsible within the company for uh, the sustainability and everything ESG. And for people who don't know what ESG is, that's environment, social governance. It's about yeah. everything sort of about the environment and sustainability and doing good in the world, Yeah, whatever that means. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm also sort of moving into sort of the more online nutrition communication side and written as well. Uh, now, I mean, I've been writing in nutrition for years, decades even, but I'm trying to focus on more on the writing and also the social media communication. Getting, and is that, getting, what's the, the goal there? Is that just to get more education out there to people that's real 
and they can believe and to, yes, to, to, to help them. Yes, um, I feel I've got some good nutrition messages that I want to share with people. Yeah, and I want to share with them for two reasons. One is because I feel they're useful and could help people. Yeah. But secondly, they're not, all my messages are not going to be right. Okay, I'm mm. going to be wrong on a few things. Okay, and how am I going to know if I'm wrong? Unless I put them out there and people challenge me on them, yeah, I'm one of the. I mean, I'm hoping today, Simon, you and I might disagree on something because if we just agree on everything, <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant, right? Yeah, but I want to know that something might might be. I might be wrong on something. At least, yeah. whilst I might stand by my guns, I might go away and think about it and learn. Yeah, and it's the same in anything, but nutrition, I think, is particularly important. Yeah, and so before we reverse right back to how you got there, I'm just really, really interested myself in. The idea came about that wasn't your idea, but how did you guys get together? Okay. And how did that original spark go from a conversation? How did the conversation come about in the first place? How were you approached? Did you know each other? And then how did that conversation turn into, okay, let's set up a project plan, let's get funding or however however it turned into a real business? So Julian, it's, it, he always was his original idea. Now, he'd already made some money on a marketing business. His background is marketing. Yeah, okay. And he'd, he'd made some money, and I, I believe he'd had a year or so off, and he was getting bored, and he tried another company. I think it was called Body Hack. Okay. And it was a, he wanted to compare different diets, dietary regimes. Yeah. But he wasn't getting people to follow them enough. Um, but he tried one himself where he was following a very strict regime. He got, in, he got into shape through it, but it was a bit of a pain preparing all the food. Yeah. But one thing he found wasn't a pain. And that was protein shakes. Yeah. So he thought, this now I know Julian, I know how his mind works, very break things down to simplicity. Why can't we get everything into a shake? Yeah. So he came up with this idea and apparently he was working on it for a few months. And then he got in touch apparently with three nutritionists. One of them was me. Yeah. I uh, responded quickly. Um, and he commissioned me to do some work. Uh, and it, and he found of, you then presumably because you're on a list of people who are highly qualified as registered nutritionists somewhere? Um, yeah, I had, uh, I'd, I'd done a lot, but previously I'd done work in, in the bodybuilding world and I've, okay. I've got an NHS dietitian's background as well. Yeah. And he'd found me, probably did a bit of a Google search, thought might look like, you know, look like I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, hopefully he, he was right. And um, and commissioned me to do the work and we worked, we worked on, it took me, um, Took me a few weeks to do the projects. Yeah. Um, and then we worked for a year trying to get the thing off the ground. This was 2014 when he first contacted me and we didn't launch until June 2015. Yeah. We were trying to find someone to blend in. That was frustrating, right? Use some of my contacts in the bodybuilding uh, protein world yeah. to find someone to blend it. They didn't really work out. And eventually we found one company who took us seriously. But I get it from their perspective, right? Mm. Everybody wants, you know, a lot of people work out and they want to be in the in the bodybuilding and fitness world because yeah. it's cool, right? They want yeah. to do something with it. So they come up with this, but I'm going to make my own protein company. Uh, and these companies, these blending companies are getting approached several times a week and they're yeah. just a waste of time. Yeah, so, because most of it, I mean, isn't it true that most of the sort of proteins that you buy, they're all made in a handful of places they don't all have their own individual processing but there's uh, i don't know how many there are these days there's, there's probably probably not that many and yeah. they, they buy the raw materials and they blend the flavors differently uh, yeah um, i mean it's probably changed a bit more in recent years although i'm out of that world now because we've got more plant-based protein yeah. powders coming on the market and, and things are a bit different mm. and so he approached you he found you you came up with a formulation mm -hmm. how does that mean that you then continue to work together that's okay. my follow-up versus okay. him just saying i want you to create the recipe yeah and then thank you very much i'll yeah so he, he ride I, off into the sunset and originally it was that i he, you know he commissioned me and paid me to do a project yeah then eventually we managed to launch in june 2015 and in the first week of launch she got some pr people involved and they got us on to um uh sky news or yeah. thought they got us onto it yeah. we drove all the way down there and it was the time that i think the french port strikes were going on okay and that was more important so they turned us away right but on the journey yeah it was literally the first week he said look this is we're going to start this company properly i'd like you to be my co-founder i said yes please i think that was the quickest conversation i've ever had i was um my other businesses in the bodybuilding world and fitness world weren't going so well at that point okay so it's very timely 
Yeah. Um, I was about to get married. This was June and August I was getting married. So uh, I thought, probably going to have a bit to do with this bloke. So I invited him to the evening do of our wedding and he yeah. came. And, um, and then we went on honeymoon just afterwards. And I remember with the wedding and honeymoon, it was broadly three weeks had gone by. And I yeah. literally noticed the difference. You know, how, how the, I said to my wife while we were on honeymoon, here, I think this business is going to go somewhere. Yeah. And, and that's genuinely, you know, I thought I was checking my emails on, on the beach in yeah. Hawaii, showing off now. And um, <laughs> I thought this, um, you know, this has got potential. Yeah. Uh, and turned out. So what were you doing before that? If we reverse right back, how did you first get into the health and fitness industry? What was your passion at that time? So let's rewind a bit back further than that, if we may. So sure. I, my, my degree was in nutrition and, and dietetics. Okay. At university, right? At university, yeah. yeah. Uh, then I graduated in 95. Yeah. Which, my age. <laughs> and um, I can see everyone's shocked. They actually think I'm that old. And it's, <laughs> um, they, yeah, I, Went back in 95, I graduated and I went and worked in the NHS as a clinical dietitian okay. for several years, which yeah. is what a lot of people did on my course. Um, I never really wanted to do this permanently. I always knew, but I also knew it would be a great experience. And it was, it was a brilliant experience. Yeah. So I was doing a lot of different things in clinical nutrition, um, including uh, weight loss, diabetic clinics, food intolerance. But I kind of moved into specializing on tube feedings so that's the the nasogastric tubes okay. and the peg tubes that people that have swallowing difficulties or critically ill or various other complications have either short or long term so yeah. I, would, I would look after people uh, with a, who, who needed a tube feed. making sure they're getting the right nutrition correct yeah whether it was solely from the tube or or partly from the tube yeah um and then um and whilst I, I, I quite liked the job and it was quite fulfilling in certain ways, it wasn't yeah. me. I kind of had a, wanted to do more. So I started my freelance consult, consultancy in 99. Yeah. Didn't, you know, I live in Northamptonshire, right? Rural Northampton, so I was seeing clients, but it was like 40 minutes each way for a trip to see someone. To see see them in right? person at that yeah. time, yeah. Which is, at that time, the normal thing to do. You wouldn't even think about doing Zoom consultations, would you? That, exactly. And, um, and then I, in two... In 2000, I started a website called Muscle Talk with a with an old uni friend. I've heard of that website. You know? Yes, so yeah, and we that at the time yeah, back of, in my old school bodybuilding days. Yeah, yeah. and so uh, I was uh, co owner of that as well with my, okay. my old uni mate, and yeah. that went well for a few years. And me and my, my my business partner Jason, who's still one of my best friends now, we had a little income every every month. It yeah. was it was a reasonable income. Okay, it wasn't wasn't had no future like you all did but yeah but you enjoyed working on it right we, we did yeah it was it was quite stressful but it was for, from we got it at the right time when forums were just taking off before yeah. social media became yeah. a thing um and muscle talk kind of went 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 quite well it was quite popular and that led me to being more involved in other things in the in in the bodybuilding world as well like show promotion and gym clothing and you were so this is because you were outside of i guess when you were in the hospitals or working for the nhs you were going to the gym and working out yeah. and actively involved in bodybuilding, yeah, exactly. developing your own physique. Yes, and I've been long before uni and I've been training. I started training at 16. I've, yeah. You know, so a good question is why did I get into nutrition in the first place? Yeah. There's two two answers to this. <clears throat> One is I was that skinny boy who got picked on at school. So cliche here, lifted up weights. and I can't imagine you being skinny looking at you. Oh, that's Like I said, when you turned up to my house... You look a lot bigger. You're a lot bigger than I thought you were from looking at your pictures. I guess pictures are just headshots yeah. Yeah. and you don't have that typical bodybuilder, you know, thick neck, meathead look. You look athletic, yeah. but actually very muscular, right? I, I mean, several years ago, I was, I probably had a stone more muscle and was, yeah. was a bit bigger. Yeah. Um, a bit more meatheady, maybe. Yeah. But, I've definitely lost a bit as as you hit your forties and then into your fifties, you start thinking more of longevity and you want to train more functionally. So I've kind of changed that. Yeah. But I was very much, you know, I was that cliche at school. Didn't like getting picked on. The moment I left, you know, I got picked on a lot at school. But the, the, the day I left school, I've never been picked on since. I'd started training. Training then it used mm. to really, really bother me. I know every kid gets bullied in some form or another. Yeah. But for some reason, it bothered me more than others. No, I get it. It's really interesting yeah. because I got bullied, not tons, and people would probably 
say it was banter who did it at the time for being f- overweight. I was mm. always overweight when I was a kid. And then so my solution was when I was about 13 or 14, I just don't eat breakfast or lunch. I only eat dinner, which is not a sustainable solution. But it made me lose the weight. But then I found bodybuilding at 15 and lied mm. to get into the gym and then started to learn about nutrition mm. and bodybuilding. But I guess different to you where you've said, I'm going to really self-study and learn about nutrition and health. Mm. I probably had a very unhealthy diet of just eating the same three things every day for two years. It's not good, certainly for a teenager. Yeah. I mean, we can talk, you know, there's all possible pros, underlying possible pros to fasting as an adult, but yeah. as a teenager, not what I'd recommend. But yeah, so that, that was half of my uh, motive for going to nutrition. Yeah. The other half was when I was probably about eight, my mum was diagnosed with, with terminal breast cancer. So this was back in 80, 1980. And uh, she changed her diet straight away. She went and, uh, and very focused on uh, on healthy living. She followed the Bristol Cancer Help treatment. Yeah. Now, looking back, a lot of that was very questionable pseudoscience, the kind of thing I I fight against these days. Okay. However, what it did do was bring a very health conscious mindset into our household. Yeah. And I was taught you food is is good for you and stuff like that. And yeah. I was there was a lot of talk about good nutrition and got me thinking um and i mum actually through combination of great health care and good mindset and good nutrition managed to survive another 11 years before she finally succumbed to uh breast cancer and she saw me uh she died at the end of my first year at, at uni okay. so she saw me get to uni and do yeah. do nutrition which yeah. was, was great right and surpassed what the doctors had given us. Yes, and this was, right? this was the 80s, right? Yeah. Medical advances now are, are fabulous. It's yeah. brilliant. And, um, but doctors did really, really, you know, really looked after her, which was, was great. So yeah. that was, I always say the bodybuilding and my mother are the, are the two reasons how I, why I got into nutrition. Mm. Uh, and then I studied it, you know, bodybuilding cliche, I want to learn what I can to get bigger muscles. Yeah. So knowledge is power, etc. cetera. Um, and you competed as well, right? Which is a learning process in itself, a, understanding yeah. how to get yourself in that kind of shape. I competed at a very low level. It's not big okay. around the bush here. I did. Um, but you still stepped on stage. Three, and to step three, on stage, yeah. Yeah. I think at any level, is yeah. still very difficult. I it struggle is. to stay on my macros my coach gives me from a week-to-week basis. Did, did you ever compete? In- I competed when I was 18. Right. In the ANB, it was called then, the Natural Amateur okay. Natural Bodybuilding. Yeah. I won the British Championship. Okay. And then I had nowhere to go after that. So I kind of lost my way, found, you know, drinking and going out and girls and partying and, and didn't really mm-hmm. do what I should have done, which is used it as a catalyst to move forward with bodybuilding. Mm. I was kind of like, well, I've won the under 18s. There's three years to go till the under 21s. Yeah. I can either get my head down for three years and not enjoy that aspect of my life and be religious about it, or I can just say, well, I've achieved a great thing here. I'll, mm. you know, take a back step for a few years, which is what I did. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Long um, time ago. 22 years ago. Yeah. I, I actually didn't do the party. I did the bodybuilding thing, but I wasn't so much for competing. I went to uni and yeah. I... I yeah, of course I did party a bit, but I was never a big drinker, never have been. Mm. Not to say that it was the odd night that I've always had, you know, that I have had a, a good session, so to speak. Yeah. But I was always focused on wanting to, you know, bodybuilding always came first, bodybuilding and, and studies. Yeah. Always came first. So, yeah, um, I, but I, but I, but competing wasn't for me, right? I figured out my skills were probably more in helping other people compete. So okay. I used to get people And you got more fulfillment from that yeah. than compete, competing yourself. Right? Yeah, I help people get ready uh, for shows at all, all levels, yeah. bodybuilding and strongman to some okay. degree. Um, and I, then I ended up going in promoting shows. I put on bodybuilding shows at all levels, really. I had, had a local show that I ran for years called Muscle Talk Championships because of the website. Yeah. But I also did co promote international shows at, okay. at some point as well. Uh, yeah. And that's how I met Steve Orton, who I believe you had on the podcast recently. We have had him on, yeah. yeah. Good mate now. Good guy, yeah. Yeah. Very nice guy and a good example of, well, we talked primarily on our podcast about connecting. And Mm -hmm. he, you know, there's pretty much no one that 
he doesn't know in he, terms of fitness. He really is. Yeah, he's good. And, and uh, yeah. although he's not a bodybuilder and a you know enthusiastic about that side, he's enthusiastic about health and fitness. And like we speak about now, mm-hmm. you get older, you start to think about health span and lifespan looking good, but also the training mm-hmm. transitions and changes. Yes, but yeah, very much. Yeah, he's definitely well connected guy. And I met him, I think, in two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine up to the, the run-up of the first body power, which I was a bit of an advisor, so to speak, okay. um, with them, uh, sort, of, sort of helped them put, put on the event that, that year. And so when uh, you were approached for the formulation of Huel, you were doing what? You were running the shows, running, running the website? Talk, muscle talk, yeah. and I had my consultancy as well. So that's how okay. Julian found me. And had that really... transitioned into remote at that stage, the consultancy, or were you still doing everything in person? I was I was doing on, online diet advice. So we weren't, okay. we, we weren't really on, on the, the, Zoom wasn't a thing and Skype was not that well used, but yeah. I was um, <clears throat> I was doing online uh, advice on by email and, and stuff like that. How do you feel about, do you feel like, I mean, you said to me off camera, you've been incredibly lucky and you, for that reason, you want to give back. And we spoke, we can speak a bit about that, but do you feel like it was luck that this opportunity came to you? Do you think there is something in putting out good work and good into the world? And then at some point in your life, these big opportunities will come to you, but you have to be open-minded enough to take them. That's a brilliant question. And this is one that philosophically we could talk about. I'm a determinist in the philosophical world. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever paid attention to, to the free will debates. Is there such a thing as human free will? I very yeah. much come from the determinist perspective, and I know it's going to upset a lot of people here in that. And it's, I'm not something I really feel. What does that mean? Tell me what that means. So I'm like, listen, nutritionist here, not yeah. a philosopher. Okay. Yeah. So take this with a pinch of salt. But broadly speaking, there's a question whether free will is, humans have free will. There's broadly three yeah. um, ways of thinking. There's a libertarian free will, like from a libertarian uh, political economic perspective, we we make up our own minds. We do, we're responsible, we, we have agency and we're responsible. Yeah. Most people have thought about it for a few hours, dismiss that. Yeah. It's the other two where the conflict is. There's the compatibilist, explanation where free will is some sort of emergent phenomena that comes out of of the neurological processes and then there's the determinist that yep. which is probably the argument i'm more convinced about mm. and i'm very much conscious that i am a nutritionist and i'm talking well out of my depth here but it's um it's that and the, let, let me let me put that in perspective of what i'm trying to to say about to answer your question here yeah luck versus hard work yeah well everything comes down to luck mm. in, in my perspective everything now does they are not mutually exclusive though mm. some people you know i've been asked before you know what percentage of that is hard work and what percentage of that is luck yeah they're, they're, they're mutually, not mutually exclusive mm. okay yeah. you, you can have both so do i work hard yeah i think that's the objective statement i yeah. work hard compared to a lot of other people am i the hardest working individual in the world Definitely not. Mm. But I, I, I put a lot of effort into what I do. I think about what I do. I yeah. cross check and do that. But it's all down to luck. Yeah. Where does that capability come from? Luck. I didn't make that. I was very fortunate to have good parents who supported me. Yeah. I was very fortunate to be in the latter part, born in the latter part of the 20th century in a country called the UK, where as much as everyone likes to moan about it, is brilliant. Yeah. And we can there's a lot wrong with it, but we can but it's brilliant. I'm fortunate. I've you know, I was very fortunate. I've probably got above average intelligence. Yeah. So that's not you know, whether that was my genes, whether that was my environment, I still didn't wait didn't come out of my my mother's womb and say, I'm I'm gonna do this, that and the other. It was all of it was all fortune. Mm. It's it's hundred percent luck. Yeah, and I think when people can accept that everything is luck, yeah, you can. And the, the fact that I have the ability to work hard is that not luck? Yeah, everything. If you go back far yeah. enough, it's luck. Yes. I, I I agree with you. And this is where the determinist. What I think is uh, an important point, though, is you have to put yourself in a position by working hard, thinking bigger 
there might be an opportunity. That, so for example, I'm a nutritionist. There might be an opportunity that comes my way in the future. That's mm. really big. That takes me out of this life that I'm in now. If it doesn't, I have to make, I have to force a position in my life where I'm happy. I'm happy doing the one-to-one -one mm. consultations. I'm happy creating online content. Mm. I'm happy running the website. I'm happy promoting mm. the shows. So you're not sitting there unhappy waiting for this no, yeah, it's moment. Not, you, you, but if it comes along, you've put yourself in the best position to be able to take it up. As in, if you had no online profile, you wouldn't have been found. Mm. If you weren't doing great work, mm. you wouldn't have been chosen. If you hadn't studied and done uh, study after study after study post-university mm -hmm. to better yourself, you wouldn't have impressed in order to get the job, these kind of things, right? And that's why they're not mutually exclusive. Exactly. It's yeah, still 100% yeah. yeah. luck, but it's also 100% hard work. Yeah, like going back to what we spoke about uh, before we started filming, although we were rolling, so maybe that will be in. <laughs> uh, Tony Robbins, mm -hmm. I went to Business Mastery as an attendee with no intention to become business partners with mm -hmm. Tony, but because I put myself in a position to create an mm -hmm. accounting firm that if he did due, due diligence, which mm -hmm. he did do two years worth, every single one of my clients is gonna have something good to say, mm -hmm. and we have a good reputation and we do good work. If mm -hmm. I hadn't put myself in that position, I can ask to be the UK partner all I want, mm -hmm. but I'm not gonna get that opportunity yeah. because we haven't done the groundwork. Yeah, Interesting though. So we still have to be to some degree, we have a. We have to consciously do these things, but where does the consciousness come from? Anyway, I'm very much out of my. No, it's really interesting here. though. I think it's a nice link to what we spoke about in the in the kitchen, which I wanted to mention. So I went to my kids' school this morning, which is why, thank you, we pushed the podcast back slightly. They had their first induction day to a new school, and what I loved about this school is, although the academic results of this school are probably the best in this area where we live in the Midlands, their actual focus is on happiness of the kids, fulfilling their potential, <clears throat> and then going back and doing good in the world, which I I really wanted to, go, I want to go to their school. Because <laughs> I think we forget that sometimes. We get so focused on fulfilling our potential, we can sometimes get to the point where we're not happy and we don't take enough time for ourselves. And if we are managing to be mindful, present, happy, mm. fulfill your own potential, you're then not going and giving back, right? I remember you telling me this earlier and uh, I've, I've not heard it before. I think it's brilliant because like I mentioned, we live in the West where most, cultural, most cultures in the West, North America and, and Europe or some parts of Europe are very individualistic. Yeah. And we focus on the me and the self yeah. and that's fine to a degree. But we are fundamentally social species. Yeah. And we depend on each other. That's how evolution has, has happened. Mm. Uh, and some of the Eastern uh, mindsets, take Japan, for instance, and some, some degree, as I hear, Germany as well, are much more socially community focused. Can't remember what the alternative to individualism is. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to be a philosopher here and I'm failing. Dismally. It's okay. I don't know what the word is either, but it's based <laughs> yeah. on not yeah. just thinking about yeah. yourself, but yeah. how do I use the skills that I've acquired to help other people? Exactly. And yeah. and I think it's great if we can get, you know, you're saying this is being taught in, in the school for your kids. Yeah. That's brilliant. Because if they can have that taught, if taught's the right word, or at least be influenced. Yeah. That's a better word. Yeah. Influenced yeah. at a young age to have that sort of mindset, then they'll grow up and hopefully they can spread that meme to others. Exactly. And yeah. and, and our, us as parents, we get very into okay, let's fulfill your that my kids are footballers. Let's fulfill your potential as footballers. Mm. Let's fulfill your academic potential. And we're not spending enough time thinking about are they happy? Mm. Are they doing good for other mm -hmm. kids? Mm -hmm. Where are they taking the kids that maybe come at their school and join in in football in PE and aren't very good mm -hmm. and actually take them to the side and help them mm -hmm. versus have the mentality of laughing at them? Mm -hmm. So it's really, really interesting. And I think that if you apply it to what you've done at Huel, which I'd love to talk about, I'm not sure what the brief was for creating this because... I know you said that, um, you know, the background 
of your founder is marketing, but this product is not primarily just there to make money, right? There's a gap in the market, genuinely, where people are seeking poor quality nutrition, where they don't have time to prepare a meal, and this allows them to have something that's healthy, which is why I know that Stephen Bartlett speaks about it on Diary of a CEO, and I know for a fact that he will not promote something unless he genuinely believes in it, Mm -hmm. because he has enough money. It's not about him putting products out there Mm -hmm. to make money. And so where you see a connection between someone like that whose standards and values do align with mine and this product, you instantly know that there's credibility there. So what was the brief when you came in and looked at creating Huel? And I have got a question that maybe we'll disagree on about the formulation. I'm not a nutritionist, so you'll probably just blow me out of the water. (laughs) But what's the brief for this? Is it designed to replace meals? Is it designed to be an extra snack? How do you see it being used optimally by people? So firstly, there wasn't a brief as such back in 2014 when Julian and I were quite scrappy with, with, with what we did. Yeah. Julian had an idea, put it in an email, and kind of it went from there. Um, but it was to be nutritionally complete. So make sure all the nutrition yeah. that one would need. Yeah. So it was basically we... we we launched the original powder on a co- on complete nutrition, which yep. will be defined as everything you need. If one were to have 2,000 calories per day yep. of that product, I'm not saying people should yep. or even would have 2,000 calories a day, yep. but everything would be in it on a day. Now, why 2,000 calories? Because that's what the, the regulations set everything at. And also it's it's around about a, a, a female's daily requirements and a bit less for, for an average male's. Yeah. Very much these are, these are based on... And this re- would replace one of the three meals if you So were. we don't use the term meal replacement. I know okay. a lot of people refer to Huel as a meal replacement. That's the common parlance. Yeah. But the term we use are complete foods. Okay. Okay. And there's, let me just say what I mean by complete food. It means that it's got all the all the nutrition in it. Yeah. Um, as uh, and it could be a meal. So what you've you've got the ready to drink there, which is very much a meal. Yeah. But we also have Huel bars, which are not a meal; they're a snack. Yeah. Okay. And the beauty about Huel is you can have as much or as little as you like to fit in with your to fit in with you. So, so a good example is when you turned up today and. <clears throat> super nice, James is actually nice guy. We've not met before. No, we haven't. But you turned up with some goodies, yeah. which were amazing. My wife was super happy because she's going to the gym later. She had not prepped any food. Okay. Like uh, we mentioned, I went to the football last night. We got back about 11.30. I didn't have time to prep my meals. Mm-hmm. This morning, you can see I've cooked chicken, I've cooked vegetables, I've cooked rice, but I don't have the time to eat that. I can't eat that meal while I'm doing a podcast. Yeah. So for me, uh, and this might be wrong, but a perfect use of this product is I've had breakfast, mm-hmm. I need a meal in between now and going to the gym. Otherwise, mm-hmm. I'm going to be starving when I go to the gym mm-hmm. and I'm not going to have any nutrients in me. Mm-hmm. I can sit here and sip on this Huel, flavor of which I've picked so the color scheme fits in with the podcast. Oh, yeah. Actually, I'm not uh, just saying this, but it does taste great. Normally, you have these drinks and they have a bit of a artificial aftertaste. Mm-hmm. This is the vanilla. It tastes really good. But that will replace my second meal, brunch meal. I have five or six meals a day. So I can go into my leg workout and I know I've got good nutrition in me. Mm-hmm. Is that a good use of this drink? Yes. I mean, uh, you, you can have as much or as little as you like. Yeah. So firstly, thanks for your compliment on the taste. We've worked really hard. We've got a brilliant team. Because like I've only companies. had the chocolate ones before, which are good. Yeah. But I think I prefer this vanilla, actually. Yeah, Vanilla's we've got eight, eight flavours in the registered drink. Yeah. Um, and the, the team, my colleagues at Huel have done a brilliant job of making it taste good. Let me just be clear here. I'm the nutritionist behind the product, yeah. you know, along with the other nutritionists more recently. I don't have much to do with making it taste good. Yeah. So this is, you know, credit to my colleagues. But another thing you said is, because I've got, I had the kids knocking around and we've sent them upstairs mm. to watch a movie uh, and you cannot hear them in the background. They're being quiet as mice. Is that... Kids can have this as well. Kids can. So it's designed for adults, but, um, you know, there's a lot of good reason that people should, you know, have meal times together. Yeah. And it's especially important for kids. Oh, for sure. For having fat. We have family dinner every night, five o'clock, two or three different vegetables, ideally. 
nice complex carbohydrate, nice lean protein source. And there's other reasons you should have a meal and not just the food. The social it's, it's aspect. The social aspect. Yeah, 100%. And, and there's some research done on this, yeah. which is you know, something if it's time we could perhaps talk about, but there are other benefits from eating together. So having, you know, it's, but if kids are making poor food choices, which so many do these days. Anna, we went, I took my kids to Silverstone Festival. Okay. And apologies, I have a habit. My wife tells me off all the time of interrupting people. She's like, I listen to your first three podcast episodes. All you do is interrupt your guests. I'm like, I'm not as bad as Gary Vee. So I'm on the scale of things. I'm okay. okay. Um, we went to Silverstone Festival. All there was to eat was pizza, mm-hmm. fish and chips, mm-hmm. burgers and hot dogs. So if I'd have just packed three of these yeah. in my backpack, I'd yeah. much rather give them this mm-hmm. and even a bar or something to if they're feeling like yeah. they need something more solid in their stomach just for the hunger element that they're used to eating yeah. something, which is maybe something we can speak about. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel much better about it because I don't want to give them it's a perfect and also, that junk food. Also, it's a lot cheaper these days out buying burgers. It's 18 quid the fish and chips was at Silverstone Festival. How much is a fuel? So that online, I think it works out at, oh, I don't know what it is. It's certainly less than three pounds online, but if you get it from the stores, it's between three, three fifty, maybe four pounds, depending on where you get it from. Which yeah, is, yeah, so it's, yeah. And that's a meal. And it does. Let me ask you this. I mean, this is not business related for this podcast and the episode will be slightly different, but I'm hoping that people that are now starting to watch, listen, subscribe are similar to me, interested in their own physical and mental health entrepreneurs, and they will be interested in this. The formulation has a high degree of fat in there, but it's really good quality fat. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'm going to drink this and I'm not going to get the, what's the word? It begins with S. Satation? Satiety. Satiety, as in I'm still going to feel hungry because there's not something physical in my stomach. But I don't think you do, do you? Because it's got a higher fat content, so it actually gets rid of the hunger. Fats, it it will get rid of hunger. Yeah. It's not down to the fat. Right, Let me explain. Okay. So... Satiety and appetite and yeah. cravings are very, very complex. And I can yeah. do a whole podcast episode just talking about what goes into that. Maybe so we, we have to it. have you back to help me with my okay. late night snack okay. issues. We yeah. Can, yeah, we can talk about that. So, <laughs> But satiety is, is complicated. But there's, there's some key nutrients that do affect satiety. So yeah. there are protein. Yeah. Protein is um, less caloric. Calor- Calorific? Ca- no, can't say the word. Caloric availability. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the amount of available um, calories from yeah. protein are a lot fewer than the other macronutrients. And by macronutrients, I mean protein, carbs, and fats, and fiber. Yeah. Okay. Um, so because it's got a high protein level at 20 grams per um, per bottle, or 22 yeah. grams, depending on the flavor, Yeah. Um, that actually will help keep you feeling full for longer. Okay. But more importantly, it's also the fiber. Yeah, because this has got six grams of fiber in, right? Yes, it's, it's high fiber as well, yeah. which also slows down the, the breakdown. And it's, and it's soluble fiber as well, Okay. which through a complex reaction within the body take, takes a long time to get um, broken down by the gut microbiome, you know, yeah. the good bacteria and yeah. microbes yeah. In, in your gut. Um, and that gives a, a more sustained energy release. Now, are you familiar with the term glycemic index? I am, yeah. So yeah, but for people who don't know, GI, glycemic index, is the time taken from any carbohydrate containing meal or food yep. to break down uh, for glucose, to, to, to raise blood glucose level. Okay? Yep. So products that are high uh, GI, glycemic, uh, sugary snacks, etc., give you that surge of energy and then the slump. Yeah. Well, all fuel products are low GI, meaning okay. they give you a low sustained energy. So that yep. will be, the GI will be related to the whole formulation, including the fats, which is it's there's a reasonable amount of fat in it, but it's got omega threes, which are mm. good for you, and mm. monounsaturates, yep. like oleic acid, which are also beneficial, shown to uh, as a proportionate total fat intake to um, benefit blood cholesterol levels. Okay, um, but the the because the, the reasonable fat intake and yep. the uh, as well as the carbohydrate matrix and the um, and the proteins and the fiber, yeah, all mean it's low GI. So uh, now satiety, well, you know, for instance, some, some people, my wife, for instance, she'll have half a bottle of that and that's filled her up. Yeah. I mean, personally, like you, I'm a yeah. reasonable eater and I'll have, have a full bottle and, yeah. uh, and that's great. Yeah. So satiety is subjective, but for sure it will f- fill you up on, on some level. Yeah, because normally I'm starving. It's 11.55. 
I have oats, protein, blueberries, dark chocolate, usually for breakfast. And then, you know, three hours later, I'm starving, which I was mm. before I drank that. And now I'm not hungry at the moment. Okay. Which if I just had a protein shake, which is what people mm -hmm. typically would do mm -hmm. in the place of something like you in the past where there's no carbohydrate, there's no fiber, mm -hmm. there's no added vitamins, there's nothing else in there. You, it doesn't really help your hunger for me mm -hmm. personally. I know you're saying it's individual, but for me, that wouldn't stop my hunger. If I just had a protein shake, I'd have to have a protein shake and something yeah. else. Right. Yeah. And hunger subjective, right? So personally, I, I do fasting. I haven't, yeah. eat, I haven't eaten yet since seven o'clock yesterday. Oh, wow. Since seven, and that was a, we, we do a complete protein shake as well, which is yeah. protein, vitamins and minerals. And, okay. And not the, not the, a little bit of the essential fats, but very low carb. Yeah. I had one of those after my dinner last night yeah. and I've not eaten since and I'll, I will have something, you know, I don't know, about one o'clock maybe. Yeah. Um, that's because I kind of like it. Now, I'm not here to debate the pros and cons of fasting and whether it helps fat loss or not, because I know that will get me into trouble with a lot of my <laughs> nutritionist peers. Um, but I like it. So I think that's anyone where argues we've got to. can stick it. Yeah, right. I mean, in the debate, that's where we've got to, right? Yes. I think people don't argue. The general consensus is now, if you're an entrepreneur and you get most of your work mm -hmm. done in the morning, if you don't eat and you get up and you fast, mm -hmm. you can focus mm -hmm. more and people feel like... Mm -hmm they can get more done mm -hmm. and they don't have a slump. Mm -hmm. It's probably not optimized if your just primary goal is to build as much muscle as possible. You can argue that either way. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I mean, it's, I'm getting But it's old. personal, it's all it, personal. It's personal. And, and it makes you feel good. Yeah. And it's definitely good for you to eat less often. Definitely, definitely. good to eat, to eat less often. So the fasting, I, I, I'm actually not convinced that there's anything magical happens by fasting for fat loss, apart from the fact that you generally consume less food over the day. So yeah. I'm on board with my, yeah. my peers there. It's easier to stay on your yeah. calorie requirements yeah. if you're only eating for half the day, right? Yeah. So one one thing, if we can talk briefly about fasting before we go back to where we were, there's a term I, 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 I've invented called the aging bodybuilder's dilemma. Okay. Let yeah. me explain what that is. Because yeah. I am probably an aging, well, we're all aging, right? Yeah. But I've been training since I was 16. I'm in my early 50s now and I have different motivations I want to I want to live to be old right? yeah but I want to be I want to be really old and cantankerous right but I want to be fit and able to be cantankerous right yeah. to an yeah. old old yeah. age right so I want to keep healthy but I also I've still got that that bit of a I want to look good etc yeah. and I want to look good when I'm when I'm 80 I want to be the biggest in the old people's in the old people's home okay this is my dilemma yeah <laughs> right. I so am the, the aging bodybuilder's dilemma so let me tell you about an, an, an enzyme yeah. Called mTOR. Oh, I've heard of this. Which, but I which stands know. for um, uh, mammalian or mechanism target of a rapamycin. Yeah. Okay. And it's actually an enzyme complex. We won't go down there. Now, this this enzyme is is the enzyme that needs to be switched on for protein synthesis. Okay. Okay. If it's not switched on, you don't synthesize protein. Yeah. And what are bodybuilders like? They love protein synthesis. Yeah. Now, you've heard of BCAAs, branched chain amino acids. Yeah. Now, there are three branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Yeah. And the biggie there that everyone talks about in the bodybuilding is leucine. Yeah. And the reason for that is it's the most potent stimulator of mTOR. Okay. So leucine, and to some degree the other two as well, but leucine has to be at a certain level for protein synthesis to, to tick on. Let's say yeah. we had a meal and it had no BCAAs in it. Yeah. Which wouldn't be true because every food has some degree. Yeah. Um, but it was low in the BCAAs, or especially low in leucine. Then... Um, all that protein wouldn't, wouldn't, protein synthesis wouldn't activate. Yeah. So you need a certain amount, which is why bodybuilders love to supplement with it. Now, yeah. questionable whether you actually need to supplement with it because if you have a good amount of protein, by default, you'll be getting yeah. enough protein synthesis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you want, you, broadly speaking, you imagine you have five or six meals a day. Yeah. Uh, probably because you, you train and you want to, you, you want protein synthesis to be, to be working. Yeah. Okay. And you need mTOR to do that. And also, Talk about getting older. You want protein synthesis. You want to be training. You want strong muscles because mm. that helps reverse the aging process, or yeah. at least the, helps curb the age-related decline. Yeah, it's one of the major indicators, Correct. right? Which Peter Attia has worked yeah. through his lab. Have yeah. said yeah. zone two, VO two max, stability, yes. and the amount of physical muscle you have on your front. Correct. So you need mTOR for that. Yeah. However, but 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 this is the problem with mTOR. It's it's it ages muscle. It sorry. It 
mTOR ages the body. Right. That's okay. the problem with it. So you don't want it on because it's associated with aging. Um, okay. So how do you do that? There's a dilemma. Do you see the dilemma? Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you want to curb want aging. You want protein synthesis and you want the maximum muscle. However, you don't yeah. want the aging. Element. Correct. So how do you do that? So this is where I think fasting comes in. Okay. Okay. Now this is what a lot of the research into fasting looks at. Now we've spoke about the cognitive. You know, it makes you feel clearer headed. And yeah. There's also some some sort of philosophical perspectives to do, which we can talk about as well briefly. But physiologically, uh, it's interesting because if you can go say 16 hours without eating, then mTOR will be off at least in the latter parts of it, yeah. switched off, which is great because it means it helps, hopefully, curb the aging process. Yeah. But you want it switched on for that other period. So that's where you eat a good amount of protein yeah. for the uh, eight hours or whatever. So the protein, you yeah. want it on for that period. Correct. So the protein you need mm -hmm. is synthesized well during that period. Yes. And then the rest of the yeah. time you want it off. So mm -hmm. you're minimizing the aging element over the the other yeah. element of the day. How well is the research to back this up? It's not that great. Yeah. A lot of it's theoretical, a lot of it's done in other species. It seems like a sound theory. Yeah. Is it a firm theory and could it be debunked? Has it been well replicated? Well, I don't know if it's been well replicated, but it's certainly interesting. Yeah. Okay. And that, that's enough for me. Yeah. Because and a lot of the time it is just about does it make <clears throat> common sense? And there may not be a peer reviewed study yeah. out there for it but if it makes common sense you apply it it doesn't make you feel bad you yeah, probably you feel will, good. there probably will be a study that comes out and it's uh, to prove it at some point and you know it's and there's more to it than that i like i mentioned i'm very fortunate i live in the west food is everywhere yeah. i'm not going to go hungry right if i don't have breakfast am i really going to starve do i really need that if i if I was to have one meal a day, would that be a problem? No, because as long as you eat enough nutrition in that, mm. you're not going to starve. And people, yeah, this is, you know, people are spoiled in the West and they've got yeah. plenty of food and they've got pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. And we eat food for pleasure, which is great. You know, there's, a, there's good evolutionary reasons why we must get pleasure from our food yeah. um, and not stick to, to, to boring foods all the time. Uh, I'm just smiling because I know you, you, you seem to imply that you got meticulous with the foods you prepare. Back in the day, yeah. Now yeah. I eat the same things every day. Yeah. But I design the meal plan for meals that I enjoy. Mm. Like my brunch every day mm. usually is a nice Hawksmoor fillet steak, okay. medium rare, cooked on the barbecue ideally. Mm -hmm. Char grilled green beans and broccoli is making me hungry now. Okay. And, and jasmine rice. Yeah, so you enjoy Beautiful. that, okay? But I'm I'm very much of the mindset of variety. Yeah, and we should vary what we eat for a number of reasons, and some of them are physiological, some of the psychological, which some I'm of the social. Doing. My and only variety is the evening meal, which my wife will cook. But you have a variety every day. Every day. So yeah. You are having variety, yeah. so you're yeah. having yeah. variety. So that's cool, right? Um, but this, you know, I, we we don't need to eat so much. So as I've got older, I've thought, you know, I've, I try and be conscious to think, well, do I really need that? I just try mm. to be mindful of think, well, I, I don't need that. My ancestors didn't have, didn't have the good fortune to have three meals a day. Yeah. If you go back far, far enough. So that's, it's kind of that process as well. And I'm not so saying, what's look, your routine then? You'll fast right through to when? And then how many meals do I, you have? Start, I don't have a routine. Okay. I, get, I, I broadly, most of, six days out of seven, all fast. Okay. Yeah. I may, may eat at 11, I may eat at one or two even sometimes. It varies depending on what I'm doing, how yeah. I'm feeling, if I'm busy. And I think, I don't really want dinner at the moment, I won't have it. But, yeah. uh, and, and I don't have a set number of meals after that. I just eat good food. Yeah. Uh, my wife generally prepares an, an evening meal. She's a very good cook, which is handy if you're a nutritionist. Yeah. Uh, or arguably not handy because <laughs> I should be, should be preparing the food myself and learning from it. But um, um, we, we have... Plant-based meals two or three times a week. I try yeah. and eat more more plant foods, for uh, both based on environmental, ethical, and um, physiological motivations. Um, and but I, and I vary. I have fuel regularly in my diet, not not routine. I'll have at least one fuel product a day. The days I'm in HQ are probably more because it's there and I haven't got to bring food with me. Yeah. Um, I'd say between one and three fuel. Uh, meals or snacks a day which is the proof in the pudding because mm. if you're 
happy. I mean, it could have been the case where you came up with the formulation and by the time it got onto the shelf or into the bottle, mm. it wasn't something that you wanted to drink. I wouldn't, I would have left the company. Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, well, I think you, uh, we went off topic earlier, but you were saying, you know, Julian's motivation yeah. was he'd made some money and I think he wanted to do something he was proud of. Yeah. I, I don't want to speak for him here, but I've, I've heard him say this several times and he, he was marketing uh, first and he wasn't particularly proud of it. Although mm. it was, he was very fortunate. Yeah. But he, he, he wanted to do something that Philly could, he, he, he could create something that, that he was proud of. And, he, and a he legacy, cre- I guess, as well. Yeah. Right? And he, he didn't expect you all to be this. He thought it'd be a nice little project. He wanted yeah. a community, community of people that had his products and he was happy with that. Yeah. But then he realised that actually it was soaring and he actually realised he was... He was he it was is amazing, isn't yeah. it? Because if yeah. you think it's still a very young company, now any supermarket you go in, most small shops, mm-hmm. I mean, I'd be really interested in this as a different podcast, but the distribution how it's managed to get into so many places so quickly, mm. which if you are, which you are developing a product, which is there to help people, it needs to be easily accessible for people. So yeah, the, the ready to drink is the product that's available in, um, uh, in, in retail. Yeah. Our, our new product, the daily A to Z, which is a, isn't a meal. It's a, it's a slightly sparkling flavored uh, drink yeah. with, with all the vitamins and minerals and, and fiber. And that is also appearing on the shelves now. Now, how have we got into the retail? Because we've got a brilliant team of uh, that work on that area. Mm. Um, so yeah, we've got a brilliant product, but the product you know, has to be sold. So, yeah. one would you th- say that's a one of Julian's key ethoses is, is to actually he's got the idea. He's not trying to come up with a formulation. He's brought mm. what he considers to be mm. the best nutritionist in. Then he'll bring a team of PR people, a team of marketing people, a team of distribution people, and mm-hmm. it's bring the right people in for the right area in the business. Uh, absolutely, I'm very fortunate. I work with very good people. We've got yeah. 250 people now at Hule. Wow. Globally, we've um, we're now up, up to five offices. We just opened a German office, so we you know we've got one. We've got HQ in Tring in Hertfordshire. Yeah. We've got a London office, a Birmingham office, and a New York office. Yeah. I'm um, just doing a big retail expansion in Germany now, which is why. And you must go to the gym all the time and see people in the Huel t-shirts. I do. I, I, I literally see one person every day in a Huel t-shirt. I was I went on holiday to Montene- <laughs> Montenegro a few weeks ago, right? Yeah. And I was walking down the street and walked by someone in a Huel t-shirt. Now, I've, uh, if anyone follows me on, on Instagram or, or TikTok, they'll know I recently had Huel tattoo on my calf. Oh, have you? Yeah, yeah I've got, got jeans on, so I can't. Yeah. It'd be a bit weird if I took a trousers <laughs> <laughs> Especially when, when your family's around. But, yeah. it's, um, <laughs> but I, uh, I, I thought my wife said you should have just stopped them and pointed to to my tattoo because yeah. your t-shirt. Yeah, on. yeah. But I, I, I yeah. So um, incidentally, that's been a topic of conversation because people don't know who I am. Yeah. I was on another holiday in Rhodes recently, and I was in the gym there and talking to some people, and they said, "Oh, like like your tattoo." And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually worked for the company because I didn't want to say immediately, well, what I do in the company. And uh, they said, God, you must uh, you must be a big fan of it. And it evolved from that. And they said, well, they, they had you. Yeah. And um, and they said, we saw you at breakfast. And I said, I bet you thought it was a bit weird, didn't you? They went, yeah, we did. Just thought I was a super fan or something. <laughs> but yeah. But I kind of, but that's part of the point is I've got the tattoo because look, I'm not, you know. And you I, believe in it. I, yeah. yeah. I, I, I've got a, quite a few tattoos, so I should probably get my the company that I'm involved with. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, that, you know, so, yeah, we do see people in, in the uh, in the gym or walking down the street with, with your T-shirts, which is great. And it's building a community. And so what are the goals for you with Huel moving forward? What were your goals with the new products that you've designed in terms of the formulation? So the sparkling drink. Okay. How does that complement, you know, what is that there for? And what are the other products that there? Because I didn't even know that Huel do, they do bars as well, yep. like protein bars. So, well, they, so the other products are, so we've got the powders. Yeah. So we've got the ready to drink. Let's talk about that first. They're the ones in retail that nowadays most people are familiar with because they're the ones that are available in the shops. Okay. We started with the white pouch powder, which yep. is we call regular Huel. Yeah. Which is um, based on six main ingredients, um, oats, flaxseed, MCT powder from co- um, from coconut, yeah. sunflower oil powder, um, pea protein and brown rice protein, and yeah. then a, and then a couple of other ingredients as well um, in, in later formulations, and a bespoke vitamin mineral blend to make sure yeah. it's complete nutrition. Four years ago, we launched what's called Black Edition powder, which 
is, is the more popular powder now, which was higher in protein, higher in essential fats, and lower in carbohydrates. Okay. And slightly different <clears throat> uh, different ingredients. So those would be the ones, if you were going on holiday, for example, you're going away for a trip, right. all of those, put them in the suitcase, take is, a protein shaker, happy days. Or a Huel shake. Which, or is, a which, shake. which is which is what, what I did when I went to, to Rose recently. Yeah. Took some Black Edition with me and saved some money and going out. If my wife doesn't want to go out for lunch, then I just have, have a Huel. Yeah. Um, Perfect. And, uh, and saves money as well. Um, and... Then we've got the bars, which you mentioned, um, yep. which are more, more of a snack, but they are, they're they not a protein bar, they're, they're high in protein, they have complete nutrition, they've got everything in them. And you've designed the nutrition element of all of these products? With with my team. So yeah. Uh, early, yeah. early on it was just me, yeah. but um, now I've got, we've got a team of other, other qualified. So you get other experts. people's input. And also, yeah. as you've said, you like people who will argue with you as well and say, yeah, exactly. but what do you think about oh. this? But what do you need to be challenged, right? One of the strengths of Huel, of many, many strengths of the team, is we've got a lot of qualified, experienced people, yeah. and that includes nutritionists. So we've got the direct nutrition, um, sustainable nutrition team, of which there's seven. Um, one person is a, a sustainability uh, uh, expert in the food industry, yeah. and the rest of us are registered nutritionists or dietitians. Okay, and that's a strength. There's not many food companies have got that, so there's, mm. there's six, but it's not only that. Within the product development team, the technical team, and even I think in the marketing team, we've got other people that, with a nutrition background. So, so I don't know the extent we've got yeah. probably eighteen or twenty people in the company out of two hundred and fifty yeah. who have got a good, solid, reputable nutrition background. Yeah, I'm really proud of that. Yeah, it's and, really and, interesting as well because yeah. normally in a company, marketing would just be marketing people, but actually they really need to have someone within that pod. Yeah. That, that understands in depth the product from yes, a nutrition it, standpoint? It, it, exactly. If we, you're writing we, a marketing message and writing an ad or looking at website content or copy, you need to really understand. We, we do that and they all, um, for, for both a regulatory perspective, they all should come by by the people in the nutrition team, my colleagues yeah, there. Yeah. Um, and, but, but yeah, what you were saying is I've, I've made sure that my immediate team, that the six of us, we challenge each other I'm very much into it. If they disagree with some message I'm I'm saying, yeah. I want to know, right? And they do. And you know, I, and I, I will disagree with them as well. And they might disagree back and we can have a conversation. And we have at Huel, we have nutrition club once a month. Okay. Where the immediate team and, and a few of the others who I mentioned got nutrition background come in and we take it in turns 10 minutes, maybe talking about a paper or something going on in, in the world, or we yeah. just listen in and we share and um uh, we've actually got that um with the Association for Nutrition for um, uh, CBD points for nutrition as okay. well. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it's uh, it's recognised as, as a learning thing. And I think that's really important mm. because, it, but the only thing is, it has to be something to do with the business, but that's very broad, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> we all eat. So you can yeah. take that, take that, um, it's quite to its extreme to be uh, lenient. But we, I find that really useful. I, I look forward to that once a month. Yeah. Um, sometimes I present, sometimes I listen to other people presenting. And it's your role there now to lead and inspire those nutritionists what and what else do you do and what else are your roles and responsibilities at you is it to generate ideas for new products to be constantly learning and developing yourself to see if the formulation needs to evolve based on changing science and things like that or are you just having people come in and report to you their findings and their research we're very much collaborative okay i um I do try and challenge, but I hope people challenge me as yeah. well. I, um, but I'm, I'm, Julian is very much the entrepreneur of the two of us, right? I, I, I get called an entrepreneur loads because I've got co-founder on my title. Yeah. I, I disagree with that. It's a conversation maybe for another time. What is an entrepreneur? Mm. I don't think I am. And that's fine. It's not my skill. Mm. I am more of a, an executor. Yeah. Um, but also, would like to think I've got some ideas I can contribute. So it would usually start like this with a product. So every product that's come out has been Julian's idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, but I would like to think that I've furthered his idea of every product. Yeah. So he'll come up with the original concept. So, you know, and, and I have said no to a couple, by the way, um, <laughs> that I don't think have worked, but would work not, not so much commercial. We, we've said no to a number that haven't worked commercially, yeah. but I don't think it worked from the, the science nutrition perspective. Yeah. But broadly speaking, he's had some great ideas. Obviously, they've been great because they've done well. And I, and he's given me the sort of impetus. And then 
I've probably furthered it, and then he's challenged me on other bits, uh, you know, and, yeah. and it's gone from there. But that's a really good lesson yeah. for anyone listening that has a business. We speak a, a lot on the podcast about uh, integrators and visionaries, mm-hmm. and the best businesses. I'm not sure if you've ever read a book called Traction or familiar with the EOS no, methodology. It's the Entrepreneurial Operating System. It's what we run Grow Factor on, and we run mm-hmm. any clients that come to Grow Factor and get strategic help. We help them understand EOS. It basically says, once you reach a certain size, or ideally, Mm -hmm. right from the outset, you need to have a visionary and you need to have an integrator. Mm -hmm. So Julian would be the visionary, right? He's coming up with the ideas, but he doesn't want to then go and execute. You know, he doesn't want to be involved in the manufacturing of the bottle, all of those little Mm -hmm. bits. Yeah. You need an integrator to come in who actually runs the business day to day. And different integrators that different have had different hats on. You'd be the technical integrator, for example, in mm. that scenario. Yeah, we're we, responsible for the nutrition, which is the the main element of the product, isn't it? It's one of the main elements. So yeah. we, we've got this this thing at York that we say nutrition first, yeah, but taste a close second. Okay, it's a mindset thing, right? Because we could have objectively the best nutritious, sustainable products there. Yeah. If they taste awful, no one's going yeah, to buy no them, right? Going to keep drinking yeah. them, yeah. If they're not commercially viable, if they're too expensive, yeah, no, yeah. if they're not marketed the right way, nobody's going to buy them. So you, you can do, a, you can be objectively the best product, but you've failed in that in that goal. Yeah. If it's not marketed right, taste right, isn't commercially viable. If you genuinely yeah. feel it's going to help people and, and improve people's health, you have to consider the other factors. People don't get that. I also just going back to your other point about. Julian sort of coming up with the ideas. We have a, a CEO after the first two years, Julian was sort of CEO. He realized yeah. probably not his skill, certainly not my skill. Yeah. So we employed uh, another James, James McMaster, who's been with like five and a half years now, I think maybe. He maybe, runs maybe, the maybe, business. He runs the business yeah. uh, and he's done a, does an excellent job. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's a really good, you know, and we've got a whole senior team as well with the COO, CFO. Yeah. Um, another. But that is skills. how you scale a business. You have to be uh, mm-hmm. an acknowledged upfront. Uh, which lots of people don't, and then they get stuck because they're doing everything themselves. Yes, correct. You have, you have, to, re- you have to know your skill set. You have to not be arrogant. I think the pushback mm-hmm. from people would be, okay, well, you know, Julian was financially successful. He had money. He could afford to go and hire out or hire all these other people up front before necessarily the income and the profitability came in. But you can either do it sustainably over time, like we're doing at mm-hmm. Growth Factor, or if you've got a really good business with a really good uh, model and you, people believe in you, mm-hmm. you can either go and get investment or you can get funding to go and do it. Yeah. We, but we, you can't do it all on your own. But Julian, I think I think he said before it was like 250,000 was his initial investment. Yeah. We didn't get anything, anything more until three years in when we had our first round of funding. Uh, and then we had another round of funding just under a year ago, October, I think, last year. Yeah. And we've, that's all we've had. Yeah. Um, so we've, because we've had the growth, we've managed to create the EBITDA yeah. to be able to, to move forward, which is which is very useful. And it's about, you know, well, <clears throat> making money, but having an impact. And mm-hmm. if you want to have an impact and have this product reach more people, mm-hmm. you need some upfront capital at certain mm-hmm. points in order mm-hmm. to front load the recruitment of mm-hmm. people, the marketing mm-hmm. campaigns and everything mm-hmm. else. There'll be these... Mm-hmm moments in time where you need to flood the business with capital to spend first to then acquire the results after right yes exactly yeah and we've we just announced uh, a couple of weeks ago that we're going to be launching our own manufacturing plant in milton Keynes. okay so which will be um spring summer next year be fully bringing open. jobs into that area yes as well. we are yeah there's a bit of coverage now if people go on linkedin they can read about that oh wow i know some of the local um business um magazines are, are covering us there and what have been, okay, one question actually that uh, is not an argument, but it's a question based on my understanding of what I want as a requirement. And I guess you, you might have already answered this actually. When I look at this, I'm like, fat, perfect, carbs, perfect. But uh, I want more protein Okay. for me. Mm-hmm. Why is there only 20 grams of protein in it? And is that because this is actually for the general population? Which would be right because if they might hit hit themselves with forty grams of protein, they probably okay. struggle to digest that because they're not used to it and they don't necessarily need it. So there's a couple of things there. You, you used the word only before twenty grams, which is interesting. Yeah, because, because of the, my mindset. Yes, correct. You're you're a gym girl, right? Yeah, yeah. So it, basically, all your products are designed for 
um, average people, yeah, primarily. Now, let me just, I want to come back to answer that in a moment. Just um, when we launched the original powder, yeah. you know, we had the one product, you're always brilliant, right? Oh, it's the best thing. It had one limitation, it was inflexible. Yeah. The minute we brought out uh, the black edition, the second powder, and then subsequently the complete protein, we didn't just have two powders, two choices. You had several because you can put one scoop of the, the white okay, and one scoop of black. So yeah, that then, yeah. then it became flexible. Some people use complete protein with their black edition, maybe one scoop of black edition, which is already high in protein, and one scoop of complete protein. Mm. So if I'm dieting down a little bit like I did from holiday recently, that's what yeah. I was doing, for yeah. instance. So you become flexibility, then you have as much or as little protein as you like. Okay. So someone like yourself and what you yeah. told me, the powders I think would probably suit you better. Yeah. Um, that's there because it's I mean the powders are convenient right yeah but the, the, the bottles are even more convenient especially now they're available in a lot of stores nationwide. yeah so if you're not primarily using this if you decide that actually you want a bit more protein this is for when you're you keep these in the fridge and these are for but it is still high really protein it, and it's still enough protein adequate to protein. stimulate protein synthesis there's right? adi adequate protein there for most people yeah now I can't say too much but we are working on there on that but I can't okay. say too much okay fine okay <laughs> all right but, you know, Park that, that for now. Yeah, there is just check, watch this space in a few months. Are there any other things that um, I want to talk about your time at Huel and what you're doing now, if you're doing anything outside of Huel, yeah. in terms of the giving back? But I've wanted to speak about this a lot and I haven't had the chance to have someone like you in for okay. my own selfish reasons as well. What else... Do you think the aging uh, aging bodybuilder, what was your term? The aging bodybuilder's dilemma. Aging bodybuilder's dilemma should be doing to maximize their health span and lifespan. So one of the things I've done mm -hmm. is try to be less like a bodybuilder and eat lots of fruit and veg, mm -hmm. make sure my fiber amount is optimal, take all my vitamins, minerals, fish oils, all of these kind of things, mm -hmm. have regular blood tests. I had a blood test which showed that my testosterone was really low. Mm -hmm. It was three. Okay. And I want it to be about 30. For anyone that's not done this, if you're a male and you're kind of over 40 at least, I, I would recommend getting a blood test mm. and consulting with a doctor on what your testosterone levels are and if you've got any other things that come out of that blood test that are suboptimal. So I started doing uh, HRT, hormone replacement therapy, okay. maybe a year ago, mm -hmm. with the supervision of a doctor. Blood tests every month for mm -hmm. the first three months, then six months, mm -hmm. nine months, twelve months. Now it's just every six months. Uh, and I sleep better. I've got more focus, more recovery in the mm -hmm. gym. But I've just put my levels back to where they should be at my age. Yeah, I'm not putting them to super psych, super physiological levels yeah. or anything like that. Like maybe a bodybuilder might do in preparation for a show if it's not a drug tested show. Um, what's your view on TRT? And is are there any other things that you think that people should do? Males, I guess, but people in general. So there's, there's, getting older? there's lots really of to, to help slow down the age related de decline. Yeah, and you should, and that doesn't just start when you get over 60, 65, right? I mean, I started thinking about this stuff when I was in my mid mid forties. Yeah, I should have thought about it when I was a lot younger, like yourself. Um, and you know, I think there's a young. stigma around like it for men, you know, whereas actually it's been proven that just take TRT for example, and that's just one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. If you have optimum testosterone, it's healthier for you in terms of the risk of heart disease and other diseases to have testosterone at 30 or 25 or 20 than three. Low testosterone can cause all number of problems as well. That's not an area I know much about really, so I can't really comment on that. But there are some other things about you know, age. So the best predictor of living longer and living yeah. longer healthier is a good VO2 max. Okay, so, so that is, is And VO2 max is a an objective marker of fitness, yeah. cardiovascular fitness primarily. Yeah. So the number one thing you can do is be fit. Okay. Okay. And it's something you can control to some degree. You can go out, at least walk. You know, you don't have to be a super athlete. Not if you're going to run marathons or run. So sprints. most people have Apple Watches now, right? And my understanding of VO2 max is you work out and you just get yourself in that top zone. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't. I these don't, are not I, supposed I to be that tech. accurate, but yeah. Yeah, and I don't think you need to maybe have the watches. You just need to go out and do stuff, right? Okay. Just, just get up. <laughs> How do you know do if you're doing VO two max training though? Well, if you, you don't you, have the watch. You're just uh, the the basic thing. A lot of people aren't even getting out and doing any form of exercise. Yeah. You don't need to go. Yeah, if you want to, great, and then you can go and get the tools, and you can do sprints, and you can do long you know, mixture of sprinting and and uh, longer running for forty minutes or whatever. But yeah, just go out, and go for a brisk walk, just yeah. enjoy it, and do that. You know, let's be practical here. People don't want to be super athletes. People just want to do what they need to do. Just get some exercise. Mm. Two, three, four times a week, go for a brisk walk. Yeah. If you can go to the gym, brilliant. The next next thing is probably good sleep. You need, need to sleep yeah. better quality. Yeah. Now, me just telling people to go and sleep better, that isn't going to help it. How helpful is that? Because I have every intention of sleeping well. I still wake in the night and I don't sleep. At all. I'm, yeah. I'm okay. I get, I'm sure there's a lot of people who do a lot worse than me, but I've had... The last few months, I had a couple of nights where I slept so well. Yeah, I've got my baseline, and well, if I don't get that now, I'm annoyed. And you don't track your sleep; you're just no, doing I don't. It. I just want seems to... like to me you do a lot of things. Yes, intuitively. Yes, because you're in touch with your own body. Yeah, so you can wake up and think about how you slept. Yeah, and sometimes I haven't slept so well. Yeah, and I'm and I'm kind of feel okay for most of the day. And I look back yeah. at me and I felt okay. Why was it? There's so many other things to consider, right? Yeah, other days. I haven't slept so well and I feel pretty crap all day. And I know yeah. if I'm if I'm writing, for instance, I'm just not writing as well. I just and I don't bother. Yeah. Maybe maybe I will end you know end work at a reasonable time and go and watch telly. Yeah. Maybe I'll chill out. So you won't force yourself on those days to push through. You'll be kind to yourself. Yeah. I do have a few goals. Yeah. I will try and train at least six times a week of some form or another. That sounds okay. a lot, but I'm not long duration, right? These yeah, are yeah. 40, 50 minute sessions. But you enjoy training, so I that's fine. fine. Yeah. yeah. It's so like I'll fun do, for you. Things like punishment. that. Yeah, but what time of day, what sort of exercise that will be and what yeah. days, they vary, but I just have that as a broad goal. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we've, we've talked about, we've mentioned VO2 max, we've mentioned sleep. Also stress, don't be stressed. Okay, everyone, don't be stressed. <laughs> That's just really not helpful, is it? Right? You know, change your life circumstances and you know, be fortunate that you don't have to be stressed. But how helpful is that? Yeah. So there are things you that. can do to try and help minimize how you deal with stress, like meditation, mindfulness, being more objective, being more open-minded, having more friends. But again, you can't just make people have more friends. But incidentally, in its own right, having more friends and being more social is itself a marker for longevity. Brilliant book I'm going to recommend here by... Um, her name's Marta uh, Kaska, I think her name is, called Growing Young. Okay, I'm and it's write that. partly nutrition as well. Yeah. Really good. I had the good fortune of having a, a Zoom call with her a year or two ago, okay. just picking her brains on stuff. Um, uh, I think it's really, she's also written another book called Meat Hooked, which is about meat, but yeah. Growing Young was an excellent book, I highly recommended. And that looked not just at the nutrition and exercise, but about social and eating meal times together, like we've alluded to, yeah. and how the benefits aging. Nutrition and good diet comes after all that lot. Okay. After those, obviously there's interaction, you know, so how stressed you are can relate to your diet. Yeah. Eating together relates to your diet. So there, there's a lot of overlap. But you, there's a couple of other key points just to answer your question, I think are good take-homes. Mm. Omega-3s, yeah. very beneficial. So obviously they're from, people generally associate them with um, fish oil or oily fish, yeah. which if you're a vegan, then you, you can get them from other sources. The conversion, so there's two main omega-3s that are, that are what we call conditionally essential, which are the fish oils, which are EPA yep. and DHA. Yep. Um, and you, but there's ALA, which is a, an essential fatty acid, and that's alpha yep. linolenic acid, and that can convert to the other two. Unfortunately, the conversion is not very efficient, okay. so you have to have a lot of ALA to get enough DHA especially. And do you take supplemented fish oils? So I do sometimes, yep. but fortunately, a lot of fuel products are, are high in ALA. They're not fish oils because okay. all fuel products are plant-based and, and suitable for vegans. Yep. But because we've got a good amount of ALA in our products, then there's yep. enough of the conversion to take place. How much do you recommend for people to have on a daily basis? So there is no set amount. I would just I want you to say I'm daily. You know I'm going to be WhatsApping you questions on a weekly and, basis. And that's fine. Now I'm going to we're friends, that yeah. bloke again. He's annoying me. <laughs> question, I'm trying to relax. But um, it's... Um, and that, yeah, it's fine if people want to pick my brains, uh, incidentally, on, on social media. But that's a question I, uh, so, and so, I know. So you're putting out, James is putting out a lot more content online now. We spoke about that and getting familiar and getting comfortable in front of the camera. But the main reason you're doing it is because you've built up this massive wealth of knowledge and you genuinely, we just want to share that with people. 
mm-hmm. like if you look at how much I just take what's on the bottle now and I buy a brand that mm-hmm. I trust, like I take Nordic Naturals or Jaro Formulas or some mm-hmm. of these other brands that mm-hmm. I know are reputable and I'll just take what they say to take mm-hmm. on the side now because I've given up trying to work out what you should take in terms of... And, 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 and that's great. You just eat well. So you mentioned omega-3s every day. It doesn't even have to be every day. Yeah. So the two or three times a week to have some oily fish, if you're, if you're a fish eater, yeah. that will supply sufficient omega-3s. Right, okay. Okay. Uh, but I think that's the bare minimum, mind you. I mean, Can you overdose on them? So if I'm taking fish oils every day and I'm eating oily fish sometimes? If, if you were taking, I think you'd have to go some. Yeah. You'd really have to try your okay. very hardest. Yeah. And not from eating of it. So... I don't know about that, but I'm pretty sure, confident you'd have to go some. Yeah. And it's, um, I, I mean, I think, it, uh, by the way, this is not just for age-related decline omega-3s, because they are linked to preventive um, um, cognition and dementia, help prevent dementia. It actually starts, your need for them starts in pregnant mothers. Yeah, so we give them yeah. to our kids. So yeah. we had a call with a nutritionist um, <clears throat> because Caleb, our firstborn, we couldn't conceive for two mm. years. I haven't spoken about this before, but we had uh, IVF for him. Okay. Luckily, we had him on the first round. Mm-hmm. And what came with that process, because we used a Harley Street uh, place at that time, was a consultation with a nutritionist who specialised in kids. Mm. So she said, take this while you're going through the process. Mm. And because we really liked her, we arranged a Zoom call after we'd had yeah. Caleb. And said, well, as he's growing up, what should we give him? And so it was, uh, there's a little probiotic sachet thing yeah. that he takes with a vitamin D in it, a fish oil, mm-hmm. and a multivitamin, a one-day okay. multivitamin. Yes. I mean, fish oils are the, or omega-3s broadly, it's actually fish oils. Um, I mean, you can get some vegan fish oils, if you like, because yeah. they're algae-derived. And what do the oily okay. fish eat? They eat the algae. So you're kind yeah. of the middle man or middle fish, so to speak. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, and they're great, but it's it's the one nutrient I think that should be more focused on. And I mean, there's a really interesting book by Kimberly Wilson called Unprocessed, by the way. Okay. So I think she's a psychologist and a nutritionist. She's got quite skills there. The book's useful. It's really useful. I found it a little bit political in places, to be fair. Yeah. But I understand her, her anger at the government because she wants more... Um, more government policy to support um, people on lower incomes to have good right. nutrition. And she's got a good point, to be fair. Um, but the, one of the key messages there was uh, omega-3s at all ages. So this is something, so that, that's my, the biggest message, obviously, yeah. nutritionally. You mentioned um, probiotics. Yeah. So the microbiome is so important, having a healthy microbiome. It doesn't have to be probiotics. Yeah. So the difference between probiotics and prebiotics are, for people who don't know, probiotics yeah. are the actual species. You're putting actual bacteria in. Or, okay. Okay. The prebiotics are what they eat. Right. So I would say the prebiotic element's more important. Okay. So if you've been on antibiotics, for instance, maybe yeah. having a, a probiotic afterwards to get to put the, them back in is great, but you've got to be feeding them with a diverse range of foods. Now, that right. is primarily fiber. Yeah. It's, it's a fiber-rich diet, which is where the um, people say have loads of different um, plant-based foods every week. So the diversity is equally important as the quantity. Yeah. So eat lots of different plants. And this is okay. easy, right? So that includes your cereals, nuts and seeds and different yeah. types of vegetables and fruits. It's actually not that hard. Yeah. you just got to make sure, you, which is like we were talking about variety, part of the reason that variety is so important. Yeah, and just follow the principles, like yeah. you said. And, and then and having a healthy microbiome will... You know, the, the science here is so vague because it's such a complex area. But there's, we know that having a diverse uh, microbiome is a good thing yeah. on a number of levels. What that means and the, the, the finer details is harder. You know, we know that serotonin, for instance, the neurotransmitter that's involved in happiness, so-called the happy hormone, um, we know that 90 to 95% of that is synthesized within the enteric nervous system which is the nervous system of the gut, yeah. not the brain like most people okay. think. But then, of course, it goes on and influences the brain. Yeah. Again, I'm a nutritionist, not a neuroscientist here, so I don't <laughs> want to talk out my bound, but it is something yeah. I'm very interested in. Yeah. So, yeah, eating different plants is, a, is definitely a good thing. So there's a, a yeah. few tips there, Simon, that hopefully yeah, are for keep, sure. keep you looking and so that's young. <laughs> and a softening filter and lots yeah. of Botox. Yeah, that's the, that's the, the easier one. Yeah. yeah. That's... 
And do, by the way, do your, do your editing guys, are they able to do that here? Can they make me look a bit we younger can and prettier? We can do anything. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Make can... sure we do that, guys, <laughs> for both of us, please. Um, from an entrepreneur's perspective, <laughs> is there anything that you'd recommend? I'm really interested in. So before we sat down, I had a coffee, but I also have reduced significantly my caffeine intake recently. And I've started mm. taking this product that's got mushrooms in it, the different type of okay. mushrooms. Is there anything that you found to be useful or you'd recommend for entrepreneurs in terms of focus okay. and creativity and those things? So if you're fasting and you wake up, is it just water? Or do you have green tea? Do you have a mushroom blend? Do you have anything else? So that's a great question. Caffeine's interesting, right? Because yeah. it's great for focus, co cognition, but it keeps you awake. Now, it keeps I you awake. And I find for me, it depends on, I know Tim Ferriss spoke about this. Mm -hmm. I know he's not a nutritionist, but researchers a lot, spoke about it a lot in terms of how you assimilate caffeine. Some people assimilate it really quickly, mm -hmm. so it's in and out, which I find I am, really up, but then literally 45 minutes later, I'm right back down again. I'm a bit like you, but that's subjective. This is subjectivity again. Yeah, so sure. Let me talk about, so caffeine, the half-life is broadly speaking five or six hours. That's okay. half-life means the time that half of a dose is still left in the blood. Yeah. Okay. So I was having last year four or five coffees but I wouldn't have it after 12 o'clock because I wanted to sleep yeah. and a, a mug of coffee is round about 100 milligrams yeah so that's 500 milligrams for lunch right but that means if the half-life is five or six hours that means the quarter life is 10 to 12 hours yeah do the maths I hadn't done this till January okay it was I was still probably having 100 milligrams of caffeine in my blood by bedtime yeah I might as just as well have been having a cup of coffee before bed yeah I hadn't thought of that. So it's now, okay. Now I was, I was, sleep I was sleep yeah. quality. People say, "Well, I can sleep fine." I've, I've yeah, and they probably the are falling asleep. Are they in that grade four deep sleep, which yeah. is the the one that's all important for the, the people, uh, the sleep experts like Matt Walker um, are, are suggesting? Other is that the type of sleep that's going to keep you feeling not only good the next day mm. but it's going to help um cognition yeah. and also age related cognitive decline help yeah. prevent age related cognitive decline yeah so i've cut back to having more, more tea which is roughly about 40 milligrams depending how strong you make it okay but I, I still i think ideally i want to be at the point where i'm not reliant on caffeine caffeine yeah. is a treat but i do get the cognitive and you might need it on certain days right Yes. Like, and then it has a bigger effect and then exactly. you can pull it back out again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And But you shouldn't be dependent on, I think, I mean, Michael um, Pollan, you know, the, the food and writer who's also written a couple on, on drugs. He, This is your mind on plants. He's got a whole, he's got, he covers three, um, that's his more recent book, he covers three sections and one section on caffeine. So a third of the book is caffeine. Yeah. That was brilliant. And he, you know, he's not a nutritionist, but he's spent most of his career writing about food and, and agriculture and, and stuff. So... Uh, and I love his objective perspective. Yeah. Uh, and I, that's well worth a read. Just the caffeine bit, if you don't read okay. the other, which are also good. But, but if you just read the caffeine bit, it make as a nutritionist, it brought me to think about things I already knew, but it hadn't brought to the forefront of my mind, which was not good enough, really. Yeah, and I feel for me, yeah. I know you, you're saying you've still got it in your system, but I felt really focused so I could get two, three hours really great work done but I'd get hardly anything yeah. done in the afternoon because I didn't feel great. Whereas now with a much reduced, so I'll have a pre, if I work out on an empty stomach, mm. I'll have a pre-workout. It has about 100, 150 milligrams of caffeine, like a low stim pre-workout. Um, yeah, I mean, that's still a reasonable amount of caffeine. Yeah, but I want to get rid of that eventually and go to no stim, but I'm on that at the moment. And then when I get back, I'll have this mushroom blend, which doesn't have any caffeine in it, but yeah. it has the mushrooms and then nothing else for the rest of the day. So I find I'm still able to work. This has been the biggest shift in the last year or two mm. that I've done, experimented mm. recently. I'm still able to work at three or four o'clock in the afternoon on creative tasks that require my mm. thought process, whereas before I'd have to shift just, just to admin. It, right? For me, it depends on so many factors. In Maybe if I did keep more of a tab on what I did, maybe I could identify what That's why I find this whoop good. I know it's like yeah, over data, but it has a journal on it. So depending mm. on how you're feeling, you can keep the journal and then you can see the correlations over time. Mm. Yeah, and that's useful. And uh, I know some people really, and it is useful. I probably would have a, 
you know, I'm a big fan of data and objectivity, right? Yeah. But yeah, I don't do it on myself. <laughs> but but that's because I'm all over the shop with with where you know, and I'm very much intuitive. And I, yeah. I, you know, we didn't evolve to be as individuals. We didn't evolve to, to, to we, you know, we didn't walk around with a, a McCanson Willisons or an app on our phone no, to calculate no. working out how many calories are in food. Uh, I know I'm I'm going a bit far here, but we. It's a good example to, of whatever works for yeah, you. Yeah. Being intuitive works for you, and you, uh, by the sounds of it wouldn't enjoy that process i'm very routine driven so i like the data and then making adjustments do you do you keep a training diary when you, you work out yeah yeah have you always since you were uh yeah 18? i now have an app as well yeah. so it graphs it over time see i i tried that when i was younger in my early day didn't like it yeah never kept a train i trained different and i can't yeah. understand people like you i train with ryan terry the oh, yeah, yeah. No, you know too. Uh, big guy in the men's physique world yeah. going for yeah, Mr. Nice. Olympia again this year yeah. uh, and he doesn't keep a diary yeah. at all doesn't even know what he's going to do when he walks into the gym yeah, he just sort of same. decides once he gets in there I'm the same and this guy's like one of the best yeah. and I'm not comparing myself to him at all in the world. <laughs> but, but that's the way I do it and that's partly because I train at different times of the day Yeah. so like, I, I knew I was coming here today so I trained um, probably 45 minutes later because I did, it's kind of en route Yeah. so I just, um, and that's a different time. That'd be typical. And I'd love to be like that. I genuinely would love to be like that, but I just have to recognize that that's not my personality. Mm. So having a route, having the data, having the thing, I like to fill in the check-in sheets, mm -hmm. eat the carbohydrates to the exact gram. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you can take that too far. Okay. Yeah. So coming back to the question, you is there anything, I mean, I found this mushroom blend super useful. I'm not going to mention the brand because they're not paying me for it. So yeah. Or well, maybe I will actually, if on a future one, if I do it for another few weeks, actually, and it still is good. What the right thing for me to do is not say they're not paying for me for it and not mm -hmm. mention it. Is to mention it because it's actually helping me. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you'd recommend for cognitive performance from a nutrition standpoint, um, other than just the core principles that we've spoken about? Mainly the, the core principles. If you want cognitive performance, then don't be stressed. Sleep yeah. well. So caffeine. Use caffeine sensibly. Was the yeah. answer. Omega threes, right? That's that's the biggie for me, um, and and your carbohydrates, the type Which is of the carbohydrates, brain you know, yeah. and, and hydration, and, I guess as well. Everyone yeah. on but, TikTok, but most, yeah. they're all over these. Have you seen this? These Stanley bottles that everyone has. Mm. So I went to Canada on holiday, and everyone in Canada, well, all of my family anyway, walk around with this Stanley tumbler. It's got a little handle and a straw. But if you put oh. ice in and a drink, it keeps it cold oh, for eleven okay. hours. Right, and it's a liter, one point two liters. So if you have two of those a day, if you're average person, mm. you know you've hit your hydration. And I think the big thing for me in shifting to having a bottle that you walk around with versus having a glass of a drink mm. is instead of having lots of hydration, then I'll forget to drink for two hours. If you're just walking around with a bottle in your hand, you're constantly sipping on it. You're staying hydrated throughout the day. And most people, like if you live in the UK, it's not yeah. that warm most of the time, and probably not some, in Canada as well, right? It's not, no. it's not so, hot, so hot. And you, unless you're exercising like rigorously for long periods of time, you're going to be fine. As long yeah. as you drink plenty over the course of a day, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, one, one thing that a lot of older people find is when they retired, they didn't have the, the coffee breaks at work. Yeah. And so they ended up not drinking as much. That's yeah. when it's a problem. But I think as long as you're drinking plenty and... You know, thirst isn't always a great indicator of, of hydration state. We, we yeah. know that. Yeah. So yeah, it's great if it works for you, but you don't have to take it to the extreme. You don't have to be too, I know you like to be quite anal about this thing, so I'll pick that up in this conversation. <laughs> but just drink plenty. Always have a drink broadly to hand. And yeah. whether, whether that That's is, the thing. I yeah. just found I didn't do that. I drank in the gym, then I'd go into yeah. the office and I wouldn't have anything yeah. there. Yeah. But of course, so yeah. again, it comes back down yeah, to plenty. And what people, works for you. Exactly. And... Yeah, if, and if you're not, if you need that reliance, then absolutely, that's a good thing. It, re, it yeah. will remind me to drink because I can see mm. it in my eye line, right? Yes, exactly. I'm a generous sort of person who likes to drink on my desk. I mean, I, I probably drink, one thing I'm trying to do is not drink so much in the evenings. I'm not waking so much for a wee in the night, so I sleep better, <laughs> yeah, but it's I not working out too, for yeah. me. But it's not working out because <laughs> I like to have my, you know, I like to have a drink with my meal and I yeah. have a, a complete protein made with water, albeit a small amount, afterwards. Yeah. I mean, Huel is great for getting hydration, right? Because you, you're mixing it with water. Yeah, suppose. yeah, yeah. One of other Huel products I haven't mentioned, because we went off topic, of course, just to completely change back to where we were, was yeah. the Huel Hot and Savoury. Okay. Have you, have you seen these? I haven't so, seen these. So no. these are either we've got a range of grain-based or pasta-based. 
So they are nutritionally complete meals yeah. that you, um, you you mix with hot water, e either out, straight out of a kettle or cold water in the microwave. Yeah. You stir well, leave for five minutes and eat with a spoon. Right. Okay. These sound so, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. So, sure. um, if you keep the, the thing for me is I prep and cook all my meals, but I'll do it in a card order. I'll yeah. cook all my meals and then I run out and I forget and then I'll have a half a day where I've got mm. no food. Mm. And so if you, so keep, you keep these them in, in, in stock, the, yeah. they're backups for you, right? Yeah, we've got. I think we've got ten different varieties now. I think four pastas and six grains. And these are just you go to the website. To yeah, off fuel dot com, um, and and order them there. And our other products, are, uh, you know, we're working on other varieties coming out soon as well. But we've got the we've got the ten there. Yeah, and and they're great. You know, it's um, because. You don't have to have them for a meal every day. They're there exactly if, for a backup. Is so you're a public company now? Or is no, it? we're not a public company. It's okay. private, private with investment. Okay. We, we, we were possibly talking about that. Yeah. But then obviously the world happened and Putin did what he did and everything went wrong. So we decided that's not for now. Not for now. Yeah. yeah. A good investment for the future maybe. Possibly. Do we don't know what we're going to do yet. What, um, I mean, we haven't really talked about anything, not Which negative, but... And I know I'm conscious of time now, so I'm trying to sort of bring Talk things about around. Talk about nutrition weren't we? Yeah. What do you think are some issues around nutrition at the moment? I mean, one of them is we spoke about you creating content, even though you're not that comfortable going on camera, you want to do it because of what you've got to say. Mm -hmm. And I believe mm -hmm. being a qualified accountant, I've got the qualifications to give business advice, but there are lots of people out there, business coaches, mm -hmm. giving business advice who don't even have a good, mm. successful, mm. solid mm -hmm. foundational <clears throat> business themselves and zero qualifications. What do you think are some issues with people taking nutrition advice from TikTok or other forms right now? So I'm doing some of this online content myself. So this stems from little moan I was a couple of years ago I was having with my well-respected nutrition peers in the UK. Yeah. And I was saying to her, oh, it's really pissing me off all these this bad information that's out there is she said, James, that's partly on us. We yeah. don't do it. Yeah, because the most educated yeah. people, and I've got lots yeah. of nutritionists actually as clients, they're very highly educated, mm -hmm. but a lot of the time, I guess like your typical mm. accountant as well, not that comfortable to go and create online so, content. So I'm, I've and always- You're writing journals yeah. and you do all of this stuff, but that's not accessible to the average I, person. I'm, I'm exactly, so I'm a better writer than I am a verbal communicator. So if anyone, I think you're doing all right. I'm doing all right. So I, I think I'm okay on podcasts now. Okay. It's just, I'm, I, if people want to watch my content, I'm yeah. still very much work in progress on, on the, the short, short videos of me talking to the camera with no one else in the room. That's, yeah. not, that's what I'm, I'm not good enough. But if people want to read some of my writing, I'm a little self plug here. I'm, yeah. running, I'm running a sub stack called um, Thought for Food, okay. where I've got, I think, 11 or 12 articles so far on different yeah. aspects of nutrition. But I get it, Simon. Most people you say it's not accessible. People don't want to read, and why should they? Yeah, you know. But it is great if anybody is interested in nutrition. You know, they're not long articles. They're a they're a coffee read or a lunch read. I think mm. one of the longer ones um, is a, is a fifteen. Do you put read. them on LinkedIn as well as I've, 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 I link to them on, yeah. I, on on LinkedIn? But if you just go to my Substack, what um, Substack? So Substack is a is a platform that's growing in popularity. Okay, it's a bit like long form social media. It's showing my but it's a, it's a it's a it's a a bit like a blog site okay. for written content. You can put podcasts up there as well. And yep. a lot of highly credible um, people, experts from across different disciplines yep. are, pu are, uh, are putting stuff up there. It is really the, the okay. place to be at the moment for long form. Cool. Um, blog, blogging, for instance, yep. notes, etc. cetera. So I'm, I've got mine there and um, I like reading other, other nutritionist sub stack as well. Yeah. But I, yeah. I like to read, but I get it. People don't want to read. But the reason I'm going to come back to answer your question. Well, they need moment, something short. They'll to, watch that video yeah. and say, oh, I really love that, but I actually want to actually understand yeah. it because you can't yeah. teach something in yeah. a 45 second reel. Yeah. Then they'll go and look in the description. There's the link to the Substack yeah. article. They go and read it. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but a partly the reason I enjoy writing so much is it makes me formulate my ideas. Yeah. I get different ideas in nutrition and I want to, I want to put them on paper, but it's not good enough just to make a few notes. I have to formulate them in a in a way that could be written in such a way that somebody could enjoy reading it. And that yeah. forces me to think about the English and the grammar. And that forces me to be objective. And so if I'm writing down, I don't just put what's in my head. I have to yeah. come back to it several times before I publish it. Yeah. Now, I'm going to say talk about something else now that I probably wasn't going to talk about. I have mentioned it on podcasts before. I've written a book. Okay. And I did have a publisher. 
Yeah. But I'm not going to talk too much. I've had a very bad experience with the publisher. Okay. And I'm pulling out and the solicitor's dealing with that at the moment for me. I'm, I, I am frustrated as, won't swear on your podcast, but I am incredibly frustrated that I cannot get a publisher, a credible one, to, mm. to do this. Yeah. Um, I get it. The, the nutrition space is very competitive. Every you know, there's a lot of nutrition theory books out there. The book mm. is called Thought for Food, hence the name of the Substack. Yeah, um, it's I, I you know I'm looking for a publisher who wants to take me seriously mm. because I've got three or four more other books in my head. I'm writing the second one already on calories yeah. and calorie yeah. counting, um, and I'm writing it. I'm going to write it anyway. But my motivation has waned a little. Yeah, hence the Substack to keep me motivated. Yeah. But um, yeah, I did want this book was due to come out late this year or early next year. It's I'm starting back to I'm I'm, I'm not even at square one. I'm, I'm before square one again because okay. I've had this awful experience. Yeah. Um, so if you know if there are any, I, I really what I want is a, an agent. Yeah. A book agent. If there's an agent listening to this or someone knows an agent, I'm be ever your friend. If you just just listen to me. Have a call with me. That's all, all I want. The re- and the, uh, probably, um, though, the reality is you probably already know someone that would love mm, yeah. to jump on that through the connections yeah. that you've got. I spoke with someone else on the podcast about what was one of their keys to success, and it was not being afraid to sit down and go, okay, well, this is my objective. Who can I reach out to and put myself out there and say, this is what I'm looking for? Yeah. How can you get yeah. me in touch with someone that can help me? And I bet if you did that for 24 hours, you'd probably have an agent and a yeah. publisher I've, I've once spoke, you've yeah. unraveled yourself. I have to, because of what you've done, you're so credible and what you've created. I mean, even if you pre-launched that book, I think it would be sold out because people will be so interested in what you've got to say. I, I would hope so, but I don't want to be too arrogant here because I have got, I have got some credibility through you. Nobody knows my ideas. I've only just started putting my ideas. You don't have a big platform of your own, but then I'm, I'm building the, that. It's the link to Huel, right? Yeah, and I, I have. I've only been doing the, the social media short videos for four months. Yeah, and if anyone watches them, I think you'll probably. I think people find the content quite good. Yeah, but my delivery is still a lot it takes to be improved. Right? Yeah. yeah, but I, the reason I wanted to mention about the writing, it helps me formulate my ideas. So I'm, yeah. I enjoy the writing. I really enjoy the writing process, um, and that helps me get my ideas down and formulate them and improve on them and people disagree with them. And I read some of my own earlier stuff and I think, oh, James, I don't know about that, right? Yeah. I've, I've improved, but that's, that's, that's it, isn't it, right? That's part of the process. So yeah, for sure. I'm putting content out now on social media because although I'm quite comfortable with, with this sort of thing, yeah. but I feel I've got to do the shorts more, the short videos more, yeah. because there's so much misinformation out there. Now, to answer your question, the biggest problem in nutrition is misinformation. Okay. And I, I am actually writing an article for my Substack, which will be out in a few weeks, called, called Messiah Syndrome in Nutrition. And it's probably, I'm, I'm being a bit of an ultra crepidarian myself here. I'm going out of my own zone as a nutritionist and talking mm. a bit more about the psychology. But I feel that's important yeah. because part of nutrition is communication, getting people to, to understand what good information looks like. Yeah. Now, I'm not, now, I am absolutely not saying here that people should listen to me because that would that I would be doing everything that I am criticizing, but I am hoping that I will help people learn the tools to be able to dis, to recognize what bad information is and what good information. Not is. just taking it so at face value. I'm not going to name any of the baddies, but yeah. I feel I will, should name some of the, the good, highly credible yeah. experts. So I think Giles Yo, who's been on Diet of a CEO, he is an amazing. He's his new two nutrition books, is the, one of his is the best nutrition book I've ever read. I would okay. actually say it's one of the best books I've ever read, okay. Gene Eating. And I, it, the guy is, is brilliant. There's a couple of bits I disagree with him on, but yeah. very, I've, I struggle to find anything I disagree with this guy. Okay, they, There is Lane Norton, who is big in the fitness world. I love Lane Norton. So yeah. I think he's very credible, some good information. Bought his uh, videotapes back oh, in you? the day. Oh, back in the day. Yeah, he's been around for a while, but he's really... Um, growing, you've you mentioned Peter Atia as well. I think he's yeah. very, very credible, definitely in in the in the good camp here. And there's some other online ones. So, uh, in in my peer world, there's Rhiannon Lambert. I think she's brilliant. Um, um, she's got really good content. Worth well, presumably the shorts that you put out. You're talking about other people who I, people can go and listen. I've to not put them out books. yet. I'm not. Re- I'm, I will okay. do stuff on this. Yeah. I'm, I've been more putting up things about like the neuroscience of of. Of but di- all of those people that you mentioned are highly qualified individuals. Yeah. So presumably, I'm not sure if this is one of the rules that will come out in your article, 
but look for the qualifications of people before you start listening something, to them. But it doesn't mean people don't have biases. No, I don't mean it's necessarily yeah. no. good, but it's a first step. It, if you eliminate yes. all the people that are trying to give you mm. high value nutrition advice to have zero qualifications, yeah, that's probably a good step to take. It's not, I'd also, there are some people, and I, I can't think of one to mind at the moment, but who aren't qualified, who yeah. have given some really good information. I know a couple of personal trainers, for okay. instance, who haven't got nutrition background. Yeah. They and I actually think they're really good. And, and they've got experience. And they're just, they're just open-minded. So yeah. whilst it's a good thing, absolutely the first go-to is, have they got some credibility and formal qualifications, as in a race of dietitian, race of nutritionist, or whatever the appropriate yeah. in, the, in the country they come from. I think they are good markers, but they're not the only thing. There are some very... Okay. credible others but so look out for the article but look out for so and that it's, will it's, help you yes and it's the it's the it's what they talk about the way they talk about it. it's actually it's a good way i can give three or four rules now sure of easy watch outs yeah. for what's likely to be credible information yeah so the three watch outs are do they like to demonize or food shame any particular food or food groups if anybody okay. says eat this and you will get bigger muscles or eat yep. this and you'll live to be old or more likely eat this and you'll die when you are young or eat this and you'll get inflammation. Yeah. They're very likely not credible. Okay. There's nutrition and dietetics are highly nuanced. There's no absolutes. Okay. Yep. Which, which brings me nice to the next one. They will talk in absolutes. Okay. Uh, and, and someone who's very likely to be not very credible will say this will or do this. Yeah. Some and that's very compelling. That's a very good communicator, which perhaps I'm not so good, because I'll say something like this: You should try and maybe cut down on these sort of foods, not have them so often, because it will increase your likelihood of living older and something non-committal. But that's science. That's nutrition. Yeah. And the ones I've mentioned actually do do that. But Lane Norton does it brilliantly. Yeah. He'll be non-committal, but he won't talk. You know, not talking absolutes, but still be a good communicator. Mm, mm, mm. So um, I think that's. Yeah, so th that's, and the other one is they'll, another another watch out is they'll use the word truth or fact okay. a lot. Yeah. Like some people like to list things out and go fact at the end of the sentence. Yeah. And just because you're saying it's fact yeah. doesn't make it so. Yeah. And I, the clickbait is interesting. So uh, you know, I'll say the truth about such and such or yeah. The real truth, like the truth's not enough. You need the real truth because it's not the truth. I don't understand that. But, but yeah, they'll use them. And I, I kind of get that because it's clickbaity. So uh, unfortunately, I might be using some of these clickbaity things. I won't quite kind of use the word the truth, but yeah. I think you but have to. You want to. people to watch your yeah. content, right? You have to. And if I, you I know, know it's yeah. good content. And I know, and it's unfortunate we live in a world where we have to have that. But it's the rule I will bend. Yeah. Because... We need it to pull people in. Yeah. People like it. Um, and I'll, I'll read it right. And I'll go, actually, they didn't, weren't saying that was in there. But I'm glad I listened to this because yeah. I've learned some really good stuff. Um, they're, they're three good rules. So there's talk to an absolute, yeah. demonizes particular food or food shames, and uses the word truth or fact a lot. There are other watch outs as well. But if you, if you spot them and anyone's doing those, they're very likely not very credible. And I would switch over to someone else. It's so useful for people. Yeah. Thank you, because it can be applied to any industry as well. It's not just yes. nutritionists. Yes. And online content is out there. I've never mm -hmm. heard anyone speak about three ways to see if that content is likely to be mm -hmm. credible. So that's really, really good information yeah. for people who are obviously consuming content because they're either watching or listening to the podcast. Yes. Or watching one of the short videos that yeah. we create from the podcast. Yeah. I normally sort of end up with what are your three keys to success? Uh, I want to preempt it and see if you agree with me based on me and my understanding can, of you. Before we do that, yeah, yeah. can you define success for me, please? To me, success is coming back to getting to a point in your life where you're happy, you are or you feel like you're fulfilling your potential, uh, you're doing good in the world, you're having an impact on people. To me, that's success for me. And it's all relative. So that's the biggest thing. So we always talk about at Grow Factor, helping our clients achieve success on their terms. And that's great. And I would agree with you. That's what success should look like. 
I don't know whether I've got all that. So, so I think so, that you are doing good in the world because you're offering, you've been uh, instrumentally involved in the creation of products which help people make better choices. You're putting content out in the world to educate people to be healthier around nutrition, even just some of the stuff we've talked about today. So the doing good in the world, it, it, I'm not sure whether you'd feel like you've optimized that, but you're definitely doing good in the world and you're I, having an impact. I will, I will say I'm trying to, to do that. I don't, like you said, <laughs> With my five followers on Instagram, it's actually a bit more than that, but it's not that great. It's um, <laughs> I, um, I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, that's my intention. Let me let me let me go there. That's my intention. I think so, you have a lot of humility, but f you've got to allow me to give you my perspective on you, and my perspective on you, having met you and having researched you, is you are very successful, and people will consider you very successful, who are in your field, who look at what you've achieved, what you've done, and what you speak about and how you write about topics. So it's an interesting you mentioned the word humility there because I live by four values and that's one of them. So I try to be... So you're to, definitely hitting that one, I, for I, sure. I, I, I try to. The, the other three just is honesty, rigor, yeah. and compassion. So I try and live by those four rules, and I, you know, and I fail on all of them every day. So we talked about complexity. Um, what would be two other, if you've got them, from your perspective, keys to your relative success? Yeah, whatever, whatever success means. Um, the, the, the success is having, it's being surrounded by good people. Yeah. Right. And which is arguably have some control over, but limited control. Back to the free will thing again, right? I've got a, I'm very fortunate to have a, a brilliant wife who's very supportive. We get on so well yeah um which which is brilliant we've, we've got quite different but also very similar in, in many ways so i whilst i'm sure i would would be successful would i, I don't like that word in in some format uh i can feel with, that from you i should yeah, have rephrased yeah, it with but you get, you get asked it right it's a fair question but i feel in some format without mel yeah it certainly made it a lot easier and a lot more enjoyable. And you found each other when you were really at that age where you really understood what yeah. you wanted from yeah. a partner and who you were as an individual exactly. as well. So yeah. much more chance of it actually correct being a great connection yeah. and you supporting each other. Yeah, when as you, opposed yeah. to it, 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 it is different. I'm not saying more difficult or easier. If you meet someone early twenties and then you grow together, you can end up being different mm. people. Uh, how old were you when you met your wife? 25 26 we're quite young yeah so i think we're different now and you learn to grow with each other and you learn your own mm -hmm. issues not problems but your own unique special things that make you you your own you know mental health challenges that you go through and you you know you have to sort of grow together yeah that's it's um, just it, you know you and you get there but it's a different process it is but i've you know i've had a string of long-term relationships that are broken before I was with Mel. So I had good practice, so to speak. So are we, I'm But sure having a supportive partner makes a massive yeah, difference, so that's, right? that's Because the, I'd yeah. imagine that when you got the opportunity to work, you know, on and in and with Huel as a co-founder, you were all in, you mm -hmm. know, and working really, really mm -hmm. hard and head down mm -hmm. on that as a project because it's so exciting, right? It so was. And, and she, we were together before Huel was a thing, so... She's actually been integral to m m the role of my s success yeah. in in within Huel. But it's not just you know I mentioned about uh, as good networks. Not just my wife, obviously a key person, but arguably the yeah. most important person. It's my wider circle of friends. I'm very fortunate to have a great circle of, of friends. I'm not making it how popular I am, now, guys, <laughs> but you know I'm very fortunate to have some really good friends. Yeah, and also my colleagues at Huel. So we employ yeah. really well, but I get on with them. We have a laugh. Probably, you know, a lot of banter with some of the people. Yeah. And they're also really good at their jobs. And so. do you, are you involved in the recruitment of the nutritionists? Oh, the nutritionists, yeah. yeah. Any, any in the immediate, I mean, it's absolutely. Yeah, and that's culture yeah. fit plus qualification yeah. and what they bring yeah. to the company, right? But we, we also have internal recruiters at Yule, yeah. so they know our culture. So we don't use those okay. going. So yeah. we have um, two or three people that, uh, that will 
recruit across the company because yeah. they know the culture they know what we're looking for and yeah. then they'll and then they'll get rid of some of the earlier cvs yeah uh, and then we'll have a look at a few and then go from there okay. so you know the, the first is identifying complexity and yeah. reviewing the world's not black and white the second is having a good network of people including mm. your, your spouse your partner and um and friends and colleagues yeah the third i'm going to say is one of the other values the rigor and when i you know, spoke to people having values before and i've been told that nobody's ever come up with rigor as a value before. is rigor so, like grit so no no grit's an interesting word it's a word okay. i'm not fully aligned with but rigor is hard work yeah and, but it's more than that but having intellectual rigor so to speak okay. is, is coming to cross check yourself being mindful that what you're saying is, is putting the effort into to be mindful of yourself. Yeah. So yes, it's being hard work. Uh, you know, we can all we can all work hard, and that's part of it. But can we all cross check ourselves? This is where some of the misinformation on the pseudo influencers on the internet go in. I'm sure some of them are hard working people. Yeah. But no doubt on that. Um, and some of them train, you know, work in the gym and train and got cracks of physiques, and they put a lot of effort into learning. Yeah. I'm not so sure about that. But they'll learn, but they won't look at other perspectives. And that's where rigor comes in. Being more mindful, being more open-minded. Right, cross -check, okay. Being happy to cross-check yourself. Yeah. That's the humility ties in with it as well. Being, being open to be wrong. Look, you know, living your life through the scientific method. Yeah. Uh, which people don't. And there's a big dismissal. There's a lot of, especially since COVID, there's a lot of negativity about um, science at the moment and people yeah. dismissing science. What's the alternative? Belief, and that's an interesting word in itself, belief, because belief can be being a Bayesian and reassessing based on the, the, the most recent data or just yeah. blind faith. You know, there's faith is a useful word to some degree, but there's blind faith. So if you don't believe in, if you don't value science, you're valuing just ideology. You're ideological by definition. Mm. And that's where it comes a problem. So I actually think people, while they want to dismiss science, I'm actually not so pessimistic about that. I don't think they really do. It's just cool to dismiss science. And I think if you apply the principles that you went through before, actually, uh, and we could talk about this all day long around COVID and science and facts presented, but if you look mm. at how those facts are presented, mm. what the rationale or motivation of the people who are presenting the facts yes. behind it, okay, then you can say, well, the science is sound, but actually potentially anything can be presented in a certain way to get the result that that person necessarily wants. Exactly. I mean, we don't have to go right into that. It is what exactly. it is, right? Yeah. But you have to think about the facts that are being presented to you, whether it's online content or from a government advisor on a live mm. broadcast on all channels based on a nationwide shutdown and ask, you know, can I apply my principles to this yeah. in terms of, how much can I trust this information? Absolutely. And this is where and I get the mistrust of science. I get where it's come from. Because I think governments, not just the UK government, did a bloody shoddy job during yeah. COVID. Yeah. Um, whereas the science was there. And, you know, some of it was just they didn't know and made some wrong decisions. Right? I'm not here to talk about that. And that's fine because being Bayesians at the time, it probably felt like the right, right thing. The hindsight bias is a wonderful thing, right? But I still think there was some very disingenuous stuff. So I get people's mistrust of science. But the science is there to be trusted. Maybe all the scientists aren't. Yeah. But then you don't listen to any one. This is where it comes to listening to many and different perspectives. So a lot of the cons the conspiracists will say, "Don't listen to them. They're you know they're trying to do this and the other." But then they'll listen. They'll they're still choosing who to listen to. Yeah. And that's kind of contradictory. But I think and that's probably. I don't know whether this is true, and you might not have asked Julie in this, but probably one of the reasons why he chose you is that you have this viewpoint and you have those three keys, you will not just come up with a formulation and say, that's it, because I created it, it's the best. You will have gone and looked out there at other people's opinions, looked and constantly questioned your own judgment and been open to other people questioning mm. or arguing with the product. So people get to the point where they really do trust the product, the formulation is not just being created to make money from a marketing perspective. It's been created because there's a gap in the market from a health perspective because they see the credibility in you. 
that has to have had an impact on the decision to co-found the business with you. I think I think I've got better at being that mindset in the last four to five years. That recently, to some degree, it was probably there in the early days. Yeah, but I think that's something I've worked on. Being, you know, being because because I've had because I've been involved with you. I've kind of let me let me let me finish up on saying this sort of thing. I think people trust you. Yeah, I take that seriously, and some people at work might laugh now because I'm going to use this quote. I like the Spider Man quote. With great power comes great responsibility. People trust you, and most ninety nine point eight percent of people that have fuel just drink it and don't and, think and about, don't it, think about much, it because yeah. they know this is fuel. These guys have got me. Yeah. Right. Well, that's kind of I'm in charge of nutrition. This is a nutrition product, so kind of that's on me personally. Mm. I take this very seriously. I have to deliver what the data and what I believe based on that data yeah. to be the best objectively healthy and where I can most sustainable um, product based on what I know. If I don't do that, I'm letting everyone down. Of course, there's the other, say, 0.2%, and I'm just inventing those those numbers out of thin air. Those, those, those other people that, that do criticise and give feedback, some of them positively, yeah. some of them negatively, and that's brilliant because they help me support the other 99.8% of figure I've just invented. <laughs> <laughs> but Well, it wouldn't be a podcast if we didn't have some statistics that we just... Yeah, pluck out of thin air. I'm just talking about how I value objectivity and rigor, and I've just completely invented those statistics. <laughs> I say 96% of businesses fail within a 10 year period, which was a study that was done two or three years ago. Actually, probably worse than that now. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. But, you know, gut feel was usually right. Okay, look, we could talk all, all day on this. Thank you so much for coming in. There's so much in there. For me, okay. on a personal level, super, super interesting. Um, I love the product and I love what you've done. I think you, people should definitely check you out online. Where, where can people so find people you? So people find on Huel.com for, for your products. And there's yep. a lot of great articles there that either me or my more recently, more my colleagues have written there as well. Yep. So even if you just, you don't want to buy any products, just go on Huel.com, look at our guys and articles and read about nutrition. Yeah. If you want about me, then I've got my sub stack, which is um, Thought for Food. It's James Collier, R-N-U-T-R. Okay. I'll put the links in the description. And, and they're also my Instagram and on LinkedIn and um, as well. Perfect. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we haven't spoken about today? I know we've, uh, for those of you who might not know, have run out two memory cards, switched to the backup camera, because it's one of those where, you know, when you're talking to someone, it's so interesting. You could literally, we spoke about, okay, let's try and make the podcast 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. Then it's gone to 90 minutes. Then it's gone to two hours. Yeah. You could probably talk for four or five hours about this stuff. And for me, it's a real opportunity to have you in here and grill you. Less mm. about, you know, like you said, being an entrepreneur, because that's not the focus of it. You've not had a business, started the business, and it's the business challenges. But you've achieved and <laughs> can say success in your field and been part of one of the fastest growing yeah. and still are part of founding one of the fastest growing companies in the UK, which is really, really interesting and why I'd have 50 plus, 500 plus other questions that I could go through, but we have to stop at a certain point. We have point, to stop right? on that. And that's is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you really wanted to say or are you okay? I, th I think we've we've said, we've said, I think it's been really interesting talking to you as well, Sam. Thank you for some really interesting uh, questions and conversation awesome and that's credit credit to you too thank you thanks guys that's been another episode of founder stories uh i think you'll agree today was a really special one and a bit different to what we normally do in grilling the entrepreneurial founder today we've got someone in that's helped us i think we've got so many lessons as entrepreneurs for how we can have a healthier lifestyle increase our health span increase our lifespan but from a perspective of running our own business as well, just how we think about things, how we approach it, the values that James has and how that's made him, I know he doesn't want me to use this word anymore, but how that's made him successful in what he does. That's it from me and we'll see you in the next episode.